Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to session two of the 2020 Virtual International Head and Neck Cancer Conference. This year it's hosted by Ian Nixon, consultant head and neck and thyroid surgeon NHS Lothian. Welcome to session two. It's going to deal with post treatment issues relating to head and neck cancer. Does this mirror make me look fat? Hooray! <laughs> Coming up in this session, we'll be hearing from Dr. Philip Lewis on keeping well in a COVID world, Roz Dows on surviving treatment and then living with the after effects, Emily Fong, the journey of the salivary gland from the patient to the laboratory. At the end of each session, there'll be a question and answer section. Questions and comments too are on Twitter at hashtag, and these are all capitals, HNCCONF2020. And do follow us on Twitter too. So that's what's coming up. Now don't forget to download your copy of the Delegate eBook. First we have Philip who's going to talk about the importance of early diagnosis. Philip Lewis was recently elected as president of the Mouth Cancer Foundation, a national charity supporting sufferers and survivors of the disease along with their families and friends. Hello everyone. Some years ago, I attended a production of Aladdin as a local theatre. I particularly remember the bit when the evil wizard Abanaza forced Aladdin into the cave to retrieve the treasure. Aladdin was reluctant. Oh, well, the cave was a scary place and he vacillated at the entrance. He's in again, cried Abanaza. I'm out again, murmured Aladdin, sidling past his master. A well-placed kick to the posterior part of Aladdin's ventral surface. Well, I am a scientist, you know, and he was in again, uh, but not for long. This repartee continued for some time until the audience was overtaken with hilarity by all the mayhem and confusion. This theme of in again, out again, seems to have become a way of life in the UK over recent years. Think of Brexit with all its swings of expectations before a decision was finally made. More recently, in again, out again, has applied to the lockdowns and the restrictions associated with the current coronavirus pandemic. Can we all celebrate Christmas this year as a family? Or will those of us with big families simply have to decide which of our children we love the most? Should we go out? Stay in? Go to work, work from home. There are a myriad of other considerations we need to look at to keep ourselves safe. Still, before I go on, let me introduce myself. My name's Philip Lewis. I'm the president of the Mouth Cancer Foundation, the national charity which supports mouth cancer sufferers and survivors, along with their families and friends. We raise awareness of the disease among professionals and also among the public. Much of this work is through education and I spend a lot of my time lecturing to professional groups and writing articles which promote an understanding of mouth cancer and particularly the importance of early detection. So, 
what is staying safe in a COVID world? Well, first we have to decide what sort of safe we want. A prisoner in solitary confinement is pretty safe, but that isn't necessarily the sort of thing we're looking for. It means looking after ourselves and those we care for, looking after our mental as well as our physical well-being, and maintaining a sense of proportion, being relaxed and at ease with ourselves. Safety means much more than just avoiding a disease. Although the disease we're all facing now does demand we take the necessary steps to avoid it. So that seems a good place to start. We've already had the basics drummed into us. Hand hygiene, face coverings, social distancing and all the rest. We've been advised to avoid unnecessary contact with each other. That's why I'm not in the room talking to you now but instead you're watching this online. It's a pity because although I can hopefully get my message across, an online event isn't really a substitute for meeting up and discussing things face to face. We miss out on empathy. We miss out on the feeling of camaraderie that develops when groups of like-minded people meet up. That's why it's important even in these times, to preserve as much safe social contact as we can. Humans are social creatures, and when we deprive ourselves of this element of our life, our emotional well-being can easily suffer. There are other areas where we need to take a proportional approach. Some of us may be reluctant to visit our doctor, or even go to the local hospital, because of the fear of being exposed to COVID. But we're still susceptible to lots of other conditions, which, if left untreated, can cause an equal or even more serious threat to our general health. We've heard reports of people not reporting heart attacks until it's potentially too late. And sadly, many people not reporting early symptoms of cancer. As well as my work with the Mouth Cancer Foundation, I'm also a practicing dentist and continue to run my own practice. For many years, the dental profession has been at the forefront of infection control and the pandemic has caused us all to redouble our efforts. Similar enhancements have taken place in all healthcare settings. With the result, the clinical premises are now among the safest places we can visit. There's a thing called the daughter test, which basically asks professionals, would you be happy to provide this treatment or service to your own daughter? Well, I'd like to introduce my daughter, Chloe, who works with me at my dental practice. Looks just like me, doesn't she? Since I'm happy to employ her, and she's happy to continue working at the practice, I think I've made the point that our environment is really pretty sp safe. Please, everyone, don't avoid health professionals during these troubled times. It's true, nothing is completely without risk but the risk is extremely small and well outweighs the risk of neglecting potentially serious medical conditions. Let's stay with COVID for a moment. As we know, for some, it is sadly a fatal disease, but for most of us, it's not. We're finding out more about it all the time. One interesting piece of research from Germany published in September, suggested that people with cancer are no more likely to die from a coronavirus infection than people who do not have the disease. Now, this statistic needs a bit of explaining. In fact, the number of people with cancer who die from COVID is really quite high. But the researchers showed that when age and other contributory factors 
like diabetes and other diseases, were taken into account. The cancer itself had no bearing on the risk of mortality through COVID. That doesn't mean that if you're a cancer sufferer or survivor, you shouldn't take all reasonable precautions to avoid COVID. But it does, again, put things into perspective. Another thing we know about this COVID world is that the healthier we are, the less impact the virus is likely to have. It said more than a million people in the UK have given up smoking since March because they've heard this message. This is a great time to also look at what we eat and drink and whether we could take more exercise. The health gains we could achieve will stay with us well after the pandemic is over and can permanently improve our quality of life. But wait, I've remembered, I'm a dentist. I have to say a little about what we eat and drink. Good nutrition is vital for our health. We all need a diet containing all the essential food groups and enough vitamins and minerals. Vitamins are mostly destroyed by cooking so we need to eat plenty of fresh fruit and vegetables. But how about fresh fruit juice? This is where I start to get dental. You see, fruit juice, especially from citrus fruits, like oranges and lemons, contains a lot of acid and doesn't contain the fibre that we'd get from eating the whole fruit. When our mouths become acid, Calcium dissolves out of our teeth, making them more prone to tooth decay and often making them sensitive. Nature can compensates for this by restoring the acidity back to normal, but this takes a couple of hours. So, if we drink a glass of fruit juice all in one go, well, in the long run, no real damage will be done unless we eat or drink something else that contains acid or sugar within the next hour or so. Then our mouth stays acid, and over time our teeth can seriously erode. So the message is, keep sweet or acid things to meal times. Don't sip a glass of orange juice throughout the morning, drink it all at once. Frequency is much more important than quantity. If we're going to have acidic drinks often, then drinking half a glass of water afterwards might help rinse away some of the acid. But it won't undo all the damage. It's not just fruit juice, of course. Carbonated drinks, cola and sports drinks also tend to be harmful. So the same advice applies. Keeping our teeth clean is also vital. Plaque is the film of bacteria which builds up on the teeth after eating. These bacteria also produce acids which attack the teeth and other chemicals which attack the gums. Dentists take out more teeth because of gum disease than from just about any other cause. And gum disease has been shown to reduce general health and weaken the immune system. Tooth decay and gum disease are the commonest preventable diseases in this country. But to prevent them, we need to clean all the surfaces of our teeth efficiently. Dentists and their teams are always happy to give help and advice with this. Why am I giving this sermon? Well, because this talk is about keeping safe, and that includes avoiding disease and avoiding dental emergencies, especially at a time when dental provision throughout the land is pretty limited. Staying on this subject, because dental appointments are still thin on the ground at the moment, very many people are missing out on their routine checkups. And this is serious. Because although as, as well as looking at your teeth and gums during the checkup, this is the time your dentist would be checking for diseases of the mouth, including mouth cancer. 
Sadly, there are already reports from specialist services that mouth cancer is being seen at a later stage than before the pandemic. And as we all know, early detection generally leads to much better outcomes. Now, more than ever, it's necessary to regularly self-examine for early signs of mouth cancer at home. You'll find details of how to do this on the Mouth Cancer Foundation website, where there's also a video showing the self-examination in action. Please share this information with your friends. The more people who know about this and the more people examining themselves, the more cases will be discovered early. I mentioned exercise earlier. Guess what? The Mouth Cancer Foundation can help you with that too. Why not join our free 10k awareness walk? You can walk wherever you want to and whatever distance suits you in one go. The event is carrying on right until the end of November. And again, full details are available on our website. OK, so our physical health is important. But it's also important to protect our emotional well-being as well. These really are strange times. People are behaving in strange ways. It seems like the reference points of our daily existence have been taken away. Do you have trouble remembering what day it is? I still do. And it was even worse during the spring lockdown when every day seemed the same as every other. Things we had to look forward to have gone. It's become risky to make any plans. Foreign holidays? Best not. We don't know from week to week where we can go without quarantining for a fortnight when we get home, or even if we'll be allowed to travel at all. Trips to the theatre? Forget it. They're still closed. It has to be said that this is disastrous for the performers and for the theatres themselves. I have a special interest here. My wife was formerly a professional ballet dancer, and we've maintained a great interest in the arts, attending performances whenever we can. One of the venues we love to visit is Covent Garden Opera House, which must be one of the best organised theatres in the country. They do everything to provide a great customer experience and even now keep in regular contact with their customers, presenting both free and paid for events. The Mayflower Theatre in Southampton is doing similar things, but without audiences, these theatres can only raise a fraction of their normal income. And without substantial support, none of them will be able to go on indefinitely. How about going out for a meal? Who knows? Even when pubs and restaurants are fully open, the experience isn't anything like what we were used to. Rules, regulations, restrictions. What happened to the pleasant, relaxed evenings we used to enjoy? Worst of all, family gatherings. The rule of six, if we're lucky, or no gatherings at all. Then there are the more insidious things. We've become frightened and suspicious of each other. People cross the road when they see us coming, or back into doorways, even when we're all wearing masks. We get angry with each other in supermarkets and shops, if we think social distancing isn't being observed. We get scared that we won't be able to buy what we want when we want to. So we buy too much when it is available. Where will our next roll of toilet paper come from, we ask? It's become as real a concern as where will our next meal come from used to be. Of course, our next meal could also be an issue, it's true. Many of us have already lost our jobs 
and many more may well do so. Most of us won't become destitute, but it's difficult to keep a sense of proportion. It's the new normal, we're told, but it really isn't normal at all. No wonder people are getting depressed. That brings me on to the next part of staying safe in a COVID world. Worry and depression are probably our worst enemies. They bring out the worst in us and prevent us from thinking logically and putting things into perspective. On the whole, we're really not so badly off. We live in a rich and developed country where we can take advantage of all the benefits the state has to offer. We're honestly unlikely to starve to death and can rely on the state for the essentials of life. Most importantly, the pandemic isn't going to last forever. One of two things is undoubtedly going to happen. We're either going to develop a reliable vaccine to protect us from this disease, or, like all pandemics in the past, the disease will run its course and far more of us will survive than succumb. I know it's easy for me to say, but it really is true. So, what do we do in the meantime? The most important thing is to stay optimistic. We need to take stock of our own personal situations and take ownership of our own destinies. We need to celebrate that which is good in our lives and take steps to improve that which is not wherever we can. We need to keep aware of current affairs, but avoid being sucked into despondency by listening to all the doom and gloom our media is so fond of dishing up. We need to enjoy the company of others, family and friends, as much as we are able to within the constraints we now find ourselves in. If we live alone, we need to interact with others in imaginative ways, through social media and video conferencing, for example. If we are people of faith, chances are our church or other place of worship has already set up support groups to help people with problems or just help people talk and mix with others. There are lots of other support groups available. The Swallows, for example. Social interaction is vital to preserve our emotional well-being and our emotional well-being is vital in keeping us safe in this Covid world. Alongside all of this, we need to keep a positive attitude. Watching endless depressing soaps on TV does not help. We need a bit of levity, either in what we watch, listen to or read. The expression, laughter is the best medicine, isn't groundless optimism. When we simply smile, chemicals are released into our bodies which benefit both our physical and emotional health. Really, just by smiling. The reason I'm banging on about this for so long is because our state of mind influences every part of our existence, including our physical health. Getting it right goes a long way towards staying safe in a Covid or any other world. There are other practical steps we can take. The coronavirus spreads easily. We can pick it up just by touching an infected surface or by being in close proximity to someone with the virus. An attempt to limit these risk factors is what lies behind the restrictions we're currently facing. Washing our hands regularly and using hand sanitizer really is important. It's believed coronavirus can survive on surfaces and packaging for at least three days. So when we've been shopping or received things in the post, there's a potential that if they're infected, 
they can remain a danger for quite a long time. If it's possible, quarantining items we bring into our homes for a few days may offer some protection. But let's be honest, in some cases, that just isn't going to happen. The virus is destroyed by cooking. But remember, packaging may be contaminated on the outside. So after opening, dispose of the packaging, and then it's hand washing time again. Face coverings stop infected droplets from our mouths and noses being spread through the air. The mask needs to cover the nose and the mouth to offer protection. The outer surface of the mask may become contaminated. So after use, remove it carefully and put it into a plastic bag. Remember, touching the mask may cause fingers to become contaminated. So be careful not to touch the face again before hand washing. Used masks should be washed if possible or disinfected before further use. Just talking normally can project droplets a metre or so. Speaking loudly, sneezing or coughing significantly increases the range. This is what happens when you sneeze. That's why social distancing is important. Many of us are still working from home, but if our job demands we go to a workplace, the wearing of masks and social distancing is important, even if it feels strange with people we know well. The better our immune system, the better our chances of avoiding contagious diseases, or if we do catch them, avoiding serious complications. Now we've already spoken about the importance of a healthy lifestyle. We need to make a conscious effort to ensure we're eating a balanced diet, getting some exercise and getting enough sleep. Finally, keep focused. It's all too busy to become so preoccupied with masks, keeping our distance and planning our safety that we forget to stay aware of what's going on around us. The best immune system in the world is much use when we step off the curb without even looking for that bus that's almost upon us or ignore that vital warning sign. I'd like to finish by saying a little more about the Mouth Cancer Foundation and how I became involved with it. Back in the 1990s, I attended a lecture about diseases of the mouth. The lecturer was describing all sorts of things, and among his slides was one of an advanced tumour. This is mouth cancer, he said. We could treat this disease much more effectively if only it were diagnosed earlier. But because no one is really looking out for it, we only tend to see it in its later stages. After the lecture, I started doing some research and found there were lots of signs and symptoms that could be recognised early, as well as things that increase the risk of the disease. It occurred to me that dentists could really help with early diagnosis. After all, we see patients regularly, perhaps not as regularly as their doctor, but unlike their doctor, we always look inside their mouths. As well as that, we already have knowledge of what is normal and what is not inside the mouth. So we were well placed to pick up early signs of the disease. I started writing articles about what to look out for and how to conduct an examination, then followed on with lectures for groups of professionals. I tried to stress how important it was for all members of the dental team to be involved. Even non-clinical team members were vital. Receptionists tend to know our patients well 
and will quickly notice changes in appearance or in the voice. They're often also told important things that the patient wouldn't necessarily tell the dentist about and can stress to the patient the importance of sharing this information. As the years went by, the interest in early detection of mouth cancer grew. Then, one of my lectures was seen by Krishan Joshi, the son of Vinod Joshi, who had founded the Mouth Cancer Foundation. I was asked to be involved with the charity and worked on some of its ongoing projects. The foundation exists to support everyone affected by mouth cancer and to spread awareness of the disease among the wider community. We have a really great team of people, which includes doctors, dentists, pharmacists, and mouth cancer survivors. Because of this, we can plan our educational and outreach materials with input from a variety of associated people. We produce a range of resources for the public and for professionals. Some of these have recently even been translated into foreign languages so that they are accessible to as many people as possible. We work with students, with other charities and other interested groups and provide some financial support through grants and awards to worthy causes. Ambassadors of the charity normally meet up several times a year, but this year all our meetings have had to be online. Despite this, we continue to communicate well at these meetings. Our annual 10K Awareness Walk has previously been held in Hyde Park in London. This year, we've changed the arrangements so that people can walk in their own areas. And I'm pleased to say we've had a wonderful response. We try to increase and improve our range of activities whenever we can, and are now working on an initiative which will bring together dental practices in all regions with a special interest in early detection and helping patients during the recovery stage. We've enjoyed a relationship with the Swallows for a number of years now, which we greatly value. I'm really grateful to have been invited to speak here today. Please do visit our website to find out more about us and share in our resources. So, keeping safe in a COVID world? Sure, it's a challenge, but it's one we can meet. We need to keep our heads and use our heads. The genie may be out of the bottle, but we'll soon put him back in. You don't need to be a wizard to know that. Thank you. My wife said, if I buy one more guitar, she's going to leave me. God, I'm going to miss her. Actually, probably not. Hurrah! My name is Lisa, and I'm a registered dietitian at a university cancer center in Colorado. I've been working with head and neck cancer patients for close to a decade, and I believe that the registered dietitian and patient collaboration is crucial during treatment. The dietitian can help educate and advocate for the patient so that they make it through treatment um, and optimize their nutrition throughout the entirety of treatment as well as post-treatment. Um, the registered dietitian can provide tips and tricks, especially regarding nutrition, but also other um, medications and therapies to lessen symptoms related to treatment. Good luck with the conference. I hope you enjoy the two days. Sorry we won't have our display stand, but please go to allrelief.co.uk for information, leaflets and any samples you need. 
Hiya to everybody there at the Swallows Conference from me, Emma, at Bio Extra. We hope you have a fantastic couple of days there. We've attended in the past. Unfortunately, it's all virtual this year. We've thoroughly enjoyed it and we hope you take a lot from the next two days. My message to you from Bio Extra, keep lubricated and keep well. Take care. Bye-bye for now. Hi, I'm Linda Tomarelli. I'm a speech and language therapist and I work for Speaknik. We create personalised synthetic voices for use on communication aids. My role is to support people to go through the voice banking process and to work with healthcare professionals to enable them to help their patients use our voice banking technology. I use my background as a speech and language therapist to help repair voices where the patient may have slowness or slurring and to design voices for people who have no natural speech. This means our personalised voices are accessible to everyone. Speak Unique create personalised synthetic voices for use in communication aids. This allows people to communicate in a voice that is identifiably their own through text-to-speech technology. I'm Ewan McDonald. I'm from Edinburgh. I'm Ewan McDonald. I'm from Edinburgh. It's so hard to lose speech, so anything that reduces that sense of gloss helps. In these modern times, medical technology has come a jolly long way. Here you are, sir. Enjoy your leeches. Today's leaders in technology really know their onions with the wonders of modern science. Robotic surgery knows no bounds. I say, you young scallywags, stop playing with the equipment. Indeed, it can breathe new life into patients. Now look at that marvellous healthy glow. Isn't the NHS wonderful? Where would we be without it? 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 Yes, of course, the NHS really is wonderful. And today more than ever, it's embracing modern technology for the benefit of all our lives. Nowhere is this more apparent than in the field of robotic technology. Cancer patients across the world are living proof that investment in state-of-the-art robotic surgery is working. Science is working and we must continue translating science into better cancer patient care. Hi, it's Mike Heffernan from Dr. Hef's Remarkable Mints here. Uh, I hope you're enjoying another conference, albeit in a virtual world. Uh, I also thought it would be a good idea just to let you know that we're now working closely with Swallows Charity and you can buy uh, Dr. Hef's Remarkable Mints in our new packaging uh, from our website and you'll get a 5% discount if you enter in the discount code SWALLOWS2020. And the benefit is that Swallows also get a 5% uh, revenue uh, into the charity to continue doing all the great work that they do uh, for both carers and patients alike. I uh, wish you all the very best for the rest of 2020. Bye for now. Hello, my name is Sam and I work for Flen House. Flamagel RT is for the management and prevention of radiotherapy induced skin reactions. It does this by creating the optimum healing conditions to accelerate cell renewal. It provides a protective barrier against external contaminations and provides a cooling effect that reduces pain on the patient's skin. In clinical studies, 7% of patients experience moist decomation when using Flamagel RT compared to 35% of patients using dexpanthenol. This is why we're pleased to say that 94% of patients said that Flamagel RT met or exceeded their expectation. Mouth Cancer Action Month takes place every November. We work closely with the Oral Health Foundation and all head and neck cancer charities to promote the event when dental practices across the country try to raise awareness of all head and neck cancers. To find out more, 
or to join our annual 10K Awareness Walk, please visit our website www.mouthcancerfoundation.org. Welcome to your New Look Conference, coming to you from the edge of space. Next we have Roz from South Africa who's going to talk about dealing with head and neck cancer in her country. Roz Dows from South Africa has lived with recurring head and neck cancer for 22 years, having had six occurrences and multiple operations. She is an academic pharmacist and a researcher with a focus on health communication. Hello everyone, my name is Boris and I'm a head and neck cancer patient. As you can see and hear, a fairly compromised patient. So welcome to all of you, my fellow very special head and neck cancer patients, parents, and healthcare professionals to take care of us so well. Thanks to Chris for asking me to do this virtual presentation. However, it has been my nemesis since I said yes. I was so anxious about all the technology as well as appearing in front of you in close-up on a screen with all this. I suppose that's our life as head and neck cancer patients. So from the slide, you can see that I'm from South Africa, and that's at the bottom of Africa, and I'm from Grandstown, and that's at the bottom of South Africa. I show two other towns. Now my little town is a very small one, and there are very few, well, probably no specialists here. Um, Cape Town is 500 miles to the west, Johannesburg is to the northeast, up the top there, 600 miles away, and I've had all my treatments in either one of those two places. Our local town called Elizabeth is about 80 miles away, and I've had a few, a few things down there. So my journey is a long one. It started in 1997, 23 years ago, and I tried to make it a bit more manageable in working my way through it by putting it in phases. Um, I've also had rheumatoid arthritis as a chronic disease since my early 20s, and I'm now in my 60s. Okay, back to 1997. I was normal, the good old days. I celebrated my 40th that year. I was at that time a wife, a mother, a university lecturer, a researcher, a pharmacist, a wine taster, and that's a picture of uh, me at our Christmas dinner that we had at our house. And then in the latter half of the year, I noticed a spot on the back of my tongue that every now and then was really sore. Eventually you went to the GP, the usual, had some paste, put it on, come back when you, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And this carried on for a while, and then I went to see my dentist. And he said to me, well, if you don't fit the profile, but I want you to go to the GP for a biopsy. <gasps> um, and you know why? Because his father had some cancer, so he was sensitised to it and I thank him every day. So, early 1998, I had my biopsy, and then I was referred to Tetron. Uh, what they did there, they removed a portion of the tongue, did a partial nectarsection, and came home to recover. Once I was recovered enough, I then travelled to Port Elizabeth, that's 80 miles away, for all my radiation. I mean, radiation is a bitch, isn't it? It ends to chill. And I think in some cases it's almost jealous in terms of what it does to us. After that, I thought, oh well, I'm done. You know, fuff, fuff, fuff. <laughs> oh yes. 2000 it came back as a lump in the throat, uh, sorry, in, in my neck. 
um, I was referred back to take charm for biopsy and then for the operation. They explored both the tongue, which had cancer, and they removed the lump from the neck. And then I had a right radical neck dissection. Through home again, recovered. Oh, less than a year later, I was back in Cape Town with my third occurrence. And this time it was the big guns that came out. So I had half my tongue removed, a hemiposectomy, and then it was replaced, the half was replaced, as you will no doubt know some of you, with a, a forearm flap and I had a radical neck dissection. And I think that this, oh no, hang on, I had that last time. <laughs> um, this time, this was a major life-changing operation where I really had to look at where I was in life or had to, could I continue? However, my students declared that they were able to hear me, so I was able to maintain my lecturing job. For the next nine years, there was no apparent sign of cancer. However, my mouth was busy disintegrating. So I had multiple infections, bacterial and fungal, and you will know how intrusive and painful that can be. Um, I was referred at that stage, I asked to be referred to Johannesburg because my sister was in the area. Um, I, there was a period of osteo-radionecrosis, so the radiation kills all kinds of things and it impairs blood flow. And I thought that taking the teeth out might be very dangerous without giving me hyperbaric oxygen, hence that picture. Um, I had that before and after all my bottom teeth were moved. At some stage over the next couple of years, I had all my top teeth found. Um, I went back to have gen uh, a gentle implant test and then went back later on to have my teeth loaded. So by the time um, my 50th came around, in 2007, I was, um, I was fine. I had a beautiful looking mouth. By the way, at this time of my life, I also had tuberculosis. Nothing normal about me. I didn't have it in the lungs. I had it here in that joint. Um, and I had to have 13 months therapy. And that was a pretty hard thing to do as well. Um, phase 3, it came back in 2010, this time in the anterior of the mouth, the floor of the mouth, back to Joburg, after biopsy, an operation, and they removed it. A few months later I went back up, had a PET scan, and I was displayed, all clear. So my sister and I celebrated, we dashed across the road to the pub and joined a celebratory drink. Yes, well, two years later, I was back. My fifth appearance, at then anterior floor of the mouth. They did the surgery, it was more extensive than they had anticipated. And a while after that, about two weeks after that, I was back home, I was in the lab, in a pharmaceutical second year practical, when I got the treasures call from my old surgeon. Sorry to have to tell you, we found jaw in the, we found cancer in the jaw and in the skin of the jaw. My first question to him was, can I still lecture? Will I still be able to? And you know, he replied in a way that I thought a lot about. I don't know whether to be angry or happy. I'm probably happy. He said, we're not sure at this stage. Let's wait and see. And I think in that respect, it was better for him to give me a little something to hold on to uh, in the hope that I might have a silly normal life. So I moved on to Christmas. In that year, I celebrated my last almost normal Christmas. 
in January as she, she had a spirit in, she my sister, the night before the operation, she said to me, what would you like to do? And I said, I'd like to sit somewhere in the open, watch the sun go down, and so on a bit. So that's what it is. We have that, the universe delivers, and it really was a goodbye to my old life. And you know what? If I had known that that would be the last time I could drink out of a bottle, I would have drunk a whole lot more bottles. Okay, my black, yeah. So, January of 2013, I entered hospital for a three-week stay. I had everything removed, that's all removed, that's been removed, the skin from my lid was put here, the fibula from my lid was used to fashion the jaw, and I had a rather challenging sleepy stay. But I'm not going to uh, say anything about that now. For the rest of that year, the other two operations I had were to remove cancer. They were to rehabilitate me. So in October I went back. They released a bit of a tongue that had kind of tied down, fused to the floor of the mouth, and they tried to give me a sulcus. Now at this stage, I have a top upper lip. Uh, I have a top lip, but I don't have a bottom lip. They tried to create a sulcus unsuccessfully, and then they implanted uh, the implants and they loaded it simply gentle. I'm not quite sure why, because I think it was the source of the constant infection I had for the next uh, couple of months. Very painful, very hard to live with. So I went back quite looking forward to my December operation and I woke up with my <laughs> My hair full of blood, blood all over my face. They had extended the lower mouth um, and they had placed the, the teeth. Okay, after that year, it was in time to find this. Um, I did a lot of things in the intermediate time, but I'm going to carry on to the end of my journey first. Four years later, in 2017, I turned 60. Now, you know what? I had never really thought about getting to 60. I hadn't expected to be alive, so I felt obliged to celebrate. And I did. I had a wonderful party at a local establishment with friends and families from all over, food, wonderful old music, dancing, and I had a whole lot of photos taken. And those for me are such a beautiful source of inspiration when I am really down. I look at those and think, I've had it through life. However, four days later I was oh, flat on my back, on an operation table, with my six occurrence another anterior floor of the mouth and the overlapping sun. So after all that, okay, that's end of now, my journey. So who am I, what am I, what can I, can't do? Well, I have this in robot tongue. I am scholarly impaired. I do have inadequate lip closure. So if I have to close my lips, I have to consciously, so it's but even then, I still have a hole there that they extended the mouth. Can I just say that blowing out a candle is not easy. <laughs> and it's quite funny, I think. And then I'm here, and I'm here, and I'm inside my mouth. So what is it affect? Well, it affects talking, eating, drinking, swallowing. And if you think about those four, plus add in what I look like, that's everything that's been taken away from me that defines us as normal social beings. Um, so, what is my life? What are its labels? Well, there. 
，那些人不要现在说现实，呃，那那那，俺是那些，哎，是的，是的，是，如何对吧？哎，我那些，我啊，知道。五分钟，哎，我们上抽签，上他们的人是什么？多少人是什么？嗯，还是得啊，不如阿生，因为阿叔不忙，阿叔出来了，生不如不如忙了。嗯，开始是开心，哎，好听啊，哎，舒心，哎，舒心。Man, it's first, it really is. And that my poor husband is yours all that. In the other sense, well, I mean. Look at this pretty face on my lips, and I'm thin to the illness. Okay, um, we have good days and bad days. And on the good days, when people stare at us, we can either stare back at them, or I sometimes don't. Or I just smile, and they smile back. But on those bad days. Those days when they're fragile, I have always wanted to have a t-shirt that I can rip apart, rip open my jersey and show a t-shirt that says "Fuck off, rude to share." I've never had had that t-shirt made, but a friend of mine, a few years back, had it made for a birthday. The bird is there, but she's the bird she never, and she doesn't quite bring herself to have the word "fuck" printed in bold letters. I'm quite happy with that word.、Um, so basically, I live、uh, a life that's tough. It's on the periphery. It's no longer normal. It is isolated. It's gone from being that big to being that big, and I think the loneliness is a huge consideration. I'm lucky to live in a small town. A friend is a few minutes' drive, or the neighbour.、Um, it's easier to come into easy contact, and people here get used to seeing you. In the supermarket, in the same supermarket, that's where it all changes and ends. The whole eating and swallowing thing. If I talk to health professionals, <coughs> I go into a lot of detail. But you, all your patients will know about it. You know, I have to make a、um, a bonus outside the mouth. Everything has to be moist. Lots of gravy. I use fingers. To position a piece of chicken and roll on it with my French、uh, cheese.、Uh, because I'm numb, I don't know what food is inside my mouth. I can't feel it's dripping out. And there's my serviettes. And this is how I eat. I don't even eat without this in front of my husband. I'm too messy. This kind of existence. Brings up all those fundamental questions in life: Who am I? Why am I? I there's no joy in life. I don't feel useful to anyone. What meaning do I have? Can anyone love me like this? And you know, we all have to answer all those questions for ourselves in our unique way. Listen, we have others to help him, to, to help us, but we all have to do it in our own way. I am an academic. I love and I read for a job. So one of the first books I read <coughs> was a book by a throat cancer sufferer, John Diamond, a BBC、um, columnist and commentator, and superb writer. He writes things like, "Well, would the people I love love me? Know me? Know me? If and have taken the trouble with me, if this is how I was, then I first met." You know, I read this early on in my cancer journey, and it made me both laugh because he writes in such a humorous manner about events that were mine. It was me he was describing, and I cried because I was so relieved. There was one other person in the world who was inhabiting my reality. 
Um, the other one that's a fanful is a typhus neurologist, Jewish, Holocaust, in thought concentration camps. He observed the behaviour around them, who thrive to the prisons. And these two quotes are my absolute favourites. But it can't change what's out there. We have to change ourselves, what's in here. And everything can be taken from us, but our own attitude, the freedom to choose how we are going to walk our own way. The last one there, I saw a couple of days ago, and it, was, it, it just hit me in the forehead, in the mind. And um, it goes, it is ironic that we must go to the edge to find the centre. I love that, it's so beautiful. And all our great wisdom teachers, they don't live like this. They live on the periphery and see life much more clearly. Sociologists have commented a lot on illness and what it does to our life. I love this book by Arthur Frank, a sociologist. Um, he says that as ill people, we lose our destination and our map that we previously followed on our known road. Do you not have a new road? Other sociologists talk about biographical disruption. Now, a biography is a story. So they say that our stories are disruptive. Um, and the, that's described as a fundamental rupture in the fabric of everyday life. You know, I like thinking of life as a tapestry and we start creating it from the time we are born and it's colourful and then it's a bit dull and then it has tears and rips in it that we try and repair. Well, I felt as though my life had been ripped in half. And I felt as though I had to, I didn't know this at the time, but in retrospect, I worked at trying to put together a new life for myself. Now, one of the ways that we navigate life is by telling stories about our lives. How many new patients? How many times have you had to tell your story? Does it give you a sense of satisfaction? Are you happy with it? Now, I listened to it TED Talk, and you'll see at the bottom of the slide by Laurie Gottlieb, and it really, it made me think, oh, I must talk about this. So we make sense of our lives by talking about our lives, by telling stories. And the circumstances shape our lives. So hidden that cancer shapes, defines our stories. Isn't that right? Well, hell yes. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for hidden that cancer. Um, it certainly impacts on my life. But then she says, the way we narrate our lives shapes what we become. And I thought that was so interesting. She reckons that we are very unreliable narrators of our own lives. Now let's think about this. How about you're having a bad day as a head and neck cancer patient and you've just choked yourself almost to death. You're in your chair, you have no energy, you don't feel like going out to see an old friend who's longing to see you again. You don't have the energy, you feel ugly and helpless and hopeless and I'm a loser, I'm pathetic. At the same time, your daughter is talking to a friend of hers and is saying, you know what, mum is amazing. She is having such a tough time. She's in pain. She, there's so much that she can't do in her life anymore. But you know what, when my kids are there, she forgets about all that. And she is so good to them, and they just love her. She is such an inspiration to those two children and to me. How about that, eh? Two stories about the same person, but totally different. It's all about the lens through which we look at our lives. 
These stories of friends who uh, this woman are about seeing sex by our circumstances, by our marriage, by our child, by our whatever, by where we live. And I think we're almost content to go round and round and round in that story because to move beyond that and to change takes courage and it takes a concerted walk into freedom that takes energy and commitment. We'll have to eventually see love through a different lens and how do we do that? As soon as I read that, it catapulted me back to a single episode that I experienced. It was in surgical hidden at Hansible, day six, after my operation. Now, I survived in hospital from 2000, my second uh, parents, by writing emails to my friends. It got it all out of me. And I'd like to read you, which is what I have there, an email that I wrote at the time. In the early hours of this morning, things seem just too hard. No way forward. Life is hellish. Each moment feels like I'm stuck in Dante's inferno. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The up went well, but living with all that Dante is hell. Can't swallow, can't choke, can't walk. Feet are swollen, no feeling on the other side of the foot. And the precious thought on my back is a constant source of pain. Just to divert for a moment from that, I have a 12-hour operation. I have the fibula harvested from my left leg. So for 12 hours, and I'm thin, huh? Spawny. I lay on my spawny back without moving. And as a consequence, the nerve was seriously damaged. Man, I was pissed off about that. Anyway, back to the email. This walk I'm on is one of immense pain, frustration, desperation. But the, doc the doctors say they are so pleased with my purpose. Let them exist in my health. But then, lying awake in this horrible early morning hours, at some stage during this burning in the fires of desperation, I realise that the only one who can help me is me. So stop the blabbing and set control. So I'm going to focus more on what I can do. And you know what? That was a minor shift. But it was a profoundly fundamental shift in me seeing square the shoulders. And from then on, whenever I was down, I would consciously put my shoulders down and square them. So as a result of the very severe experiences, I don't think it's time to tell you. I underwent in hospital. I thought I had to do something. So I, did, I said to myself, and as a health professional myself, I'm going to be an advocate to health professionals on behalf of patients. And I, um, the following year, I presented at a pharmacy conference. I was asked to write an article, and then that article got published in an international journal. Now, I just want you to look at the bottom at, at, at the uh, bold text. I felt as though the health system often works against rather than with me and had on occasion thrown me to the floor and ground me to a pulp beneath its foot. I do hope that you haven't experienced that. So to try and make sense of things, and now uh, this is my journey of a long decades. I have done various things, courses, meditation, in uh, different communities of practice, spiritually, and I have put them all in these three neat little circles. And I think it's essential to look after the body, the mind, this is what drives us, and the spirit. And we're all going to do it in our own very unique way. It's people who are going to help us, maybe our belief system, feeding ourselves good food, and making sure we take exercise. Um, I'd like to come down to the last point and the spirit. 
Hansesit Fischenen Lass and Wiesen Weise. I will never stop learning I don't want to. I want to find out more about people, about the human spirit. So who am I now? Well, at the top, I'm a student of life. I'm still life mother friends, <coughs> a long-term patient. <coughs> On the other side, teacher, supervisor, researcher, writer, health professional, and at the bottom, patient advocate to the health professions. All of this is grounded by me being a head and neck cancer patient. Now, it's just being a head and neck cancer patient. Let's not uh, get too far away from that reality. But it has fundamentally changed me as a person. It's made me a better person. There's been a hell of a lot of bad, but there is good. And I hope that by talking to you, I can help you that much. Carers, don't let your, your patients get away with relying on you too much. Give them a bit of a prod, okay? Just like I was given a bit of a prod to do this presentation. And I have enjoyed talking to you, so I'm going to leave you with my email details. I would love to hear from you, please. Um, to my, to all of you, goodbye, to my fellow head and neck cancer patients, you are, I love you without knowing you, you are my family, you are one of me, and I am one of you, and I would like to wish you all for the rest of your journey and the rest of your story, love, life, and strength. Bye-bye. Hi, it's Guy from CC Med. Just want to wish everyone at Swallows all the best of luck at their virtual head and neck cancer conference. Such a shame we can't be there this year, but let's hope to get some get together next year. We at CC Med obviously look after the AS Saliva or Thyma Dry Mouth range. If you'd like to learn more about that, then please visit us on our website. In the meantime, best of luck. Sure, it's going to be a great couple of days. Really looking forward to it. My name is Amber Thomas. I'm a registered dietitian and a board certified specialist in oncology nutrition. Before I started my own private practice, I worked in a cancer center for over 10 years and we primarily helped individuals through head and neck treatment. And I feel very strongly that working with a dietitian is very important for your success going through such a difficult treatment. The dietitian should be able to help you find foods that you can tolerate, foods that you can eat, which may include things you're not used to or changing uh, the texture or modifying the food in some way because of the side effects that you'll experience. Your dietitian should know the side effects for your particular treatment and be able to provide you guidance even ahead of time before those side effects actually happen so you're prepared and you're ready to stay nourished and stay strong. So working with a dietitian is absolutely so important to help you heal both during the process of treatment and after. Hello everyone, my name is Lewis from Flint Health. Many of us are suffering from skin reactions that often gives us no choice but to give up on the activities that we enjoy the most. We at Flynn Health want to provide innovation that allows everybody to enjoy the life that they love. This year we are proud to be supporting this year's Swallows event and honoured to be involved with such an inspiring charity that work extremely hard to help patients and carers. At this year's event we'll be hosting an educational breakout session which gives you the opportunity to learn more about radiotherapy by one of the country's most respected radiographers. Also, a fantastic opportunity to discover a solution for your skin that at present may be very sore, itchy and red following on from radiotherapy treatment. It is extremely important that this year we bring clinicians, patients and supporting companies together as one to be supported and to support others. Hi, this is Joanna Knight from Capitex Healthcare. Uh, we're very proud to sponsor the virtual Head and Neck Conference 2020. Thank you.
ほほう、にへえ、はは。Cancer centers. We're here, right where you need us. Hello, my name is Daniel Hughes. I'm from Aspire Pharma, and we really hope you're enjoying your conference today. We're here to talk to you today about oral mucositis and dry mouth, specifically alprolite mucosamine. You can find out more information about mucosamine by visiting our virtual stand. We'd love to virtually see you, and we hope you have a lovely virtual conference. Hello, my name is Abby Miller. I'm a speech and language therapist working at Chesterfield Royal Hospital in North Derbyshire. I recently won a fellowship from the National Institute of Health Research to help me learn how to carry out research in the health setting. And I'm studying a master's at the University of Nottingham. I would like to use these skills in order to benefit patients with head and neck cancer. We know that people with head and neck cancer return to work less often than people with other cancer types. I really want to understand what it's like to return to work following head and neck cancer, what was tricky, or what helped you. So I'm keen to speak to anyone who has gone back to work to understand your experiences, and I would do this by a one off interview, either on the telephone or virtually, at a time to suit you. If you'd like to find out more information or take part in this study, that would be fantastic. You're very welcome to contact me on my email address. I also have a Twitter account、um, where I recently wrote an article explaining what's happening in the research internationally around head and neck cancer and return to work. So please do contact me, or of course, you can leave your email address and contact details with Chris and he'll pass them on to me. Thank you. Hello, my name is Philip Lewis. I'm the president of the Mouth Cancer Foundation, the national charity which supports everyone affected by the disease. We work to improve awareness and provide education both for the public and healthcare professionals. Early detection is the key. That's why we've developed our self examination protocol. To find out more about us or to join our annual 10K awareness walk, Please visit our website www.mouthcancerfoundation.org. Hooray! Dry mouth affects one in four adults within the UK and can have a significant impact on your overall health. That's why we created Oraleave, a complete oral care range for dry and sensitive mouths. The enzyme system found in all Oraleave products helps supplement natural saliva to help keep your mouth healthy and comfortable. Designed with dry mouth sufferers in mind, our products are free from alcohol or foaming agents that can irritate a sensitive mouth. Headquartered in Luton, Bedfordshire, our small and super friendly team works to help raise the awareness of dry mouth with healthcare providers and patients alike. You can visit our website, drop us an email, or give us a call from Monday to Friday, 9 am to 5 30 pm. We are ready to answer your questions about our range and process your orders. We love hearing from you. Oraleave, making dry mouths happy again. Hi, I'm Dr. Elaine Emerson, and I'm a research leader at the Centre for Regenerative Medicine, a research centre at the University of Edinburgh. 
Join me for a special behind the scenes virtual tour of our laboratories and to find out more about our research to develop new treatments for head and neck cancer patients recovering from radiotherapy. When Chris was diagnosed, he just switched off straight away. He didn't take anything on board, he didn't listen to anything. He just went into his own little zone. He, um, he decided he couldn't peg feed himself. He was just far too lazy to be bothered to do it. He just couldn't be arsed, basically. Um, he thought it would be so much better for me to feed him. Um, coming from a day's work, in my black work suit, have to feed him and then decides he's going to cough and this mixture flies all over me and he sits there laughing like a right, you know, clever sod that he is when poor me is dripping in all this food, I've got to clean it up. It's still on the ceiling because he can't be asked to clean it off or even decorate. Um, he went into his own little, what I call cancer bubble, where it was all about him. He didn't care about me or the family. He just sat there like a right miserable little twat. Um, you know, to be honest, that's my nickname for him now, miserable twat. He's not got any better. You know, he puts a big smile on for everybody else, but he don't give a shit about the rest of us. <laughs> I went to a really tough medical school. We had to find our own cadavers and bring them in. Now we have John, who's a head and neck cancer survivor, who's going to talk about no spit living with dry mouth. Our next presenter, oh, it's me. My name is John Holmes and I'm 72 years young. My grandsons say I'm vintage, not old. I'm a head and neck cancer survivor and I've been married to Linda since 1980. We had planned big celebrations for our Ruby wedding in April, but coronavirus scuppered that. My presentation is called No Spit. Hello folks, welcome to sunny Blackpool. The sun is shining beautifully here. It's the middle of August and we're recording ready for November. It might not be sunny where you are now. Right, I'm back inside now. Now I'm going to have to take these glasses off because I can't see my script. So let's put the other ones on and let's get on with it. My presentation is called No Spit and I'm going to tell you how I have managed no saliva for the last 11 years, simply what's worked for me. It's not Swallow's policy it's not, and I'm not medically qualified and I'm not endorsing any of the products I use but if any of the companies I mentioned want to send me a brand new car that's fine with me. Also, as I go through, I'm going to tell you that other products are always available. But first, I want to ask you a question. During this lockdown, I've been trying to learn Japanese and it's dead easy. I'll give you an example. What's the Japanese word, phrase for a baby's nappy? The answer, sack of poo poo. It's easy. Now it says here, pause for laughter and huge applause. <laughs> Thank you, folks. OK, are you sitting comfortably? Then I'll begin. First thing was diagnosis. On Friday the 16th of October in 2009, I went to our local Victoria Hospital to get the results of a biopsy on a lump on the side of my neck. So I was taken to a small room where a nurse was sitting on her own reading through some paperwork. She looked up as I went in and she said, oh, you're on your own then. 
And I said, yes, I'm on my own. Why would I not be? Oh, this isn't good news, is it? The thought that it could be cancer had not even been entered our heads at home and none of the medics had mentioned it either. The consultant came in and told me it was throat cancer. The full diagnosis was, and I've got to read this, squamous cell carcinoma, left oropharynx involving left tonsil, base of the tongue and soft palate. And then afterwards were these figures. Apparently T4 is the largest and most invasive tumour. N2 meant there were secondary tumours in my neck and lymph glands. MO was no other secondaries. <laughs> Some good news then. My immediate reaction was anger that this beast had invaded my body. I said, is it terminal? And the consultant said, no. And I said, then we will beat the bat, won't we? And this was the foundation of my fight back, folks. I firmly believe that a positive attitude helped me to beat this. My next thought was, oh my God, how do I now tell my wife, Linda? She'd just nursed and supported me through a double heart bypass in the July of 2009, and now this. I found that the fear and the panic which is normal was best dealt with for me by doing this. I didn't want to let the cancer take over, I wanted to stay in charge. They wanted to start my treatment straight away, but I said no, can I please have a week if that won't make things worse? And they said yes, okay. I went home, I told my wife, and I told the kids and their families. This was Friday afternoon when I had the di diagnosis. On Saturday, we went to our local travel agent and on Sunday, we flew to Cyprus for a week's holiday. My decision, not the cancer. Now let's look at treatment. It was carried out at Preston General Hospital, chemotherapy and 35 sessions of radiotherapy, no operation. One of the things that really annoyed me before I had all of this was having to have my back teeth out. I'd looked after my teeth really well all my life and I was really annoyed at losing them. One day in the shower, I had a handful of hair and I thought, right. I went downstairs and I said immediately to my son, shave my head, please. And he said, why dad, you've still got hair. And I said, no, this is my decision, not the cancer. I'll have a shaved head because I want to. Let's look at managing the after effects. First of all, talk about dry mouth and swallowing. That's why we're called swallows, because people have difficulty in swallowing. First of all, I want to say a very, very, very big, big, big vote of thanks to the speech therapist at the Victoria Hospital for getting me over the first huge hurdle, which was my very first swallow. I couldn't do it. I couldn't put anything in my mouth, not liquid, not solid, not anything. I was scared stiff that I was gonna choke and die. She was called Beth, and I really wanna say thank you, Beth. I had to try and overcome that first bit. Later on, however, I did find that real ale and Guinness worked really well and sometimes not in moderation either. Oh, there are other real ales and beer available. <laughs> Phlegm was a problem too. So now I gargle every morning and every night and I, before I go to bed and I really am amazed at how much it brings up and I would recommend that to anybody. So I mentioned about phlegm and gargling and I find it really helps. But let me just show you what I do. It may sound silly to show you how to gargle, but this works for me. I 
hardly anything at the moment, which is great. But at the end of the day, there's always usually a lot that goes down there. Cheers. I manage dry mouth by carrying a bottle of water in my rucksack and I'll come back to my rucksack later. And I also use, where's my first one? I use this, which is called Oraleave Moisturising Mouth Spray. I find for me, I've tried quite a few, and I find for me, this works best for me. But remember, also, <coughs> reflux can be a problem I found. So what I do is I take these. Get them on prescription from the doctor, and I'm still getting them now. Um, and I take one a day and these stop the acid coming from my stomach up into my esophagus which again can be a problem. A bit like indigestion but it's awful and I do need to take them to keep it down. Okay so as usual halfway through this I need to have a little drink of water. Oh that's better. Okay next thing I want to talk about is eating. I've split it into two. Eating at home and eating outside of home. At first, <clears throat> and I'm sorry to mention this while you're sitting there, but I suffered from very, very severe constipation. So I had to look at eating a lot more fibre. I start off by having the same breakfast now that I've had probably for the last ooh, 10 years at least. I do vary it now and again, but mostly this is what I have. And I'll show you what it is in a minute when we go into the kitchen. Right, so welcome to our kitchen. This is my breakfast that I have most mornings because of the fibre content and it stops the constipation and it really works. First of all, I have, I put four prunes and chop them up. I have two figs and I make sure I take out the little stiff stem and chop them up and I chop up a banana. I then have one handful of high fibre and I use that one there, all together. <laughs> and just because I like it, I use soya milk on top of it all as well. And it works really, really well. And it actually tastes quite good. But be careful, because every cereal, especially this one, has a high sugar content. So the other thing I do with fiber is I take, on prescription from the doctor, something called fiber gel. And it's a husk. I take one in the morning and one in the evening, but you must read the instructions and get your doctor to make sure it's okay for you. You must not take it immediately before you go to sleep. Okay, everybody, all at once, what am I gonna do now? Okay, let's look at my soup maker now. This is the one that I've got all together and it works really well. It's for homemade soups. A lot of the tinned soups I found have got lots and lots of sugar and lots of additives. So I didn't really want to do that and fresh always tastes better. This is very automatic. You put everything in there once you've chopped it together and then you just simply pick the uh, menu choice, the program that you want. And this is how you do it. Pop that on there like that. Choose the menu and I'm going to show you something. There's four different programs and I'm going to hold that. There's nothing inside, but listen to this noise. Now that's quite noisy. So this has a dual purpose because when you put it on, it's automatic. So you turn it all on and it starts to heat up and then it starts to blend, but it blends when it feels like it. So when you're over here working away on this side and that noise goes on, it works as a laxative as well. Choking. Food gets stuck in my throat, like it might do with you if you've got dry throat or no saliva, when I don't chop it up enough. And I've recently discovered that I choke quite frequently if I talk when I'm eating with my mouth full, which you'd be surprised to hear. It didn't seem to happen very often. Yes, it did. So now I'm trying to not do the two things at the same time and it's working. I've always got water nearby always and gravy and sauces not spicy sauces because I can't do that they help too and I'm not afraid to ask for them but I'll come to that in the next section eating out for a lot of people this is something that they've stopped doing 
because they feel embarrassed or uh, they don't want to take such a long time eating. So what have I done that's helped me? First of all, I told Linda early on in the cancer that we would not stop going out to eat because we used to love it. Eating out at restaurants, going on holiday and eating uh, foreign foods. I said, uh, we've always enjoyed it and we don't need to go and find a menu just for me. The internet allows me now to look at the menu if we know where we're going and I can spend a long time deciding on what I want it to eat rather than having to spend loads of time and people waiting for the order to be taken when I'm actually in the restaurant. When I get to the restaurant, before I order, I tell the staff that I have had throat cancer and have no saliva. And I found that may, m mentioning the word cancer actually makes them very supportive. If I need extra gravy or extra sauce, I ask for it. And normally it comes, usually free of charge. So at friends' houses, I found that invitations had dropped up a bit at first because people didn't really know how to handle my problem. And I'd also become a cancer bore. I was talking about it all the time whenever we went anywhere. Now I discuss the menu with friends in advance and tell them what I need, if anything, and they're all fine with that. Oh, and I've stopped being a cancer bore. I'm not embarrassed when I go out anymore about being slow to eat. I need to chew my food. It's better than choking or leaving loads of food on the plate. Real friends and real colleagues understand. If you eat three meals a day, over 365 days a year, that's 1,095 challenges every single year and you can rise to these challenges and change most of them to successes and give the big C the middle finger. Okay, the next thing, let's talk about talking. Ha! My career was in training and development and presentations. So I really, really felt it when I found it difficult to talk because it was something I'd done all my life. So what do I do now? I have plenty of water or liquid nearby, as you can see, and I've politely asked my family to refrain from finishing my sentences if I stop for breath or I stop for water. Politely. I told you before, I was really annoyed at losing my back teeth. I'm going to keep the rest of them. I brush my teeth carefully after each meal, gently, and I use an electric toothbrush in the morning and at night. I keep a toothbrush, toothpaste and a flosser in my rucksack. Rucksack comes later. Let's have a look at what I use. All the dentists and the doctors seem to prescribe this. It's called Durafat and I get it on prescription from my dentist. I also use Biotin, which is a fluoride toothpaste for people, especially with a dry mouth. And I get this on prescription from the doctor. Thank goodness for the British NHS. And the final thing I do to look after my teeth is I use a toothpick and a flosser. And I found this one, which is combining them both. And I find it's really good. I've got one very big gap between two teeth here and food always gets stuck in there. So this really helps. Get ready, all together. So what else helped? First of all, my wife and my family were incredible. I didn't dwell at any stage on these questions. Why me? Is there a God? How did I get this? I've never smoked a cigarette, which is true. That helped because then I started thinking positively and not about blame. Another thing that helped was I joined the Swallows. In March 2015, I joined as a volunteer. I was fundraising, I was attending events, and I was supporting our Blackpool charity shop. Have I mentioned our charity shop yet? It's probably the best charity shop in the world. October 2006 to October 2019, I also was team leader 
for our patient and carers monthly meeting that we held here in Blackpool. And now there are lots of these all over the world, I'm very, very, very pleased to say. I met some incredibly brave and inspirational people during the course of my tenureship as team leader, and I'm very, very grateful for having met them. I realised very quickly how lucky I am. Some of them will never ever eat properly for the rest of their lives. I can. I'm still a volunteer and I'll continue to support this wonderful charity as long as I can. And I think the Queen's Award for Volunteers says everything. I also investigated every offer of help that was given to me just to see if it was any good for me without rejecting it out of hand. I also learned that if you bottle your feelings up, one day that bottle will burst. You have to talk. You have to talk. You have to talk. Looking good can help to feel good. And regular exercise has all sorts of benefits when you cope with all this. And I also moisturise my neck twice a day because that's the area that starts to make you look older. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for watching. I hope it'll help. And if I haven't joined the Great Weatherspoons pub in the sky by the time this goes out, I'll be holding a question and answer session as per the programme. Stay safe. horse goes into a bar. Bartender looks at him and says, why the long face? Hooray! Hooray! Hello everyone. I'm Jyoti Benjamin, a member of the Academy of Foods and Nutrition and a certified specialist in oncology, currently working at Kaiser Permanente, Bellevue, Washington State. Head and neck cancer patients undergoing treatment need a dietitian by their side on a regular basis, if not daily. The nutritional needs of head and neck cancer patients are unique and they correlate to the outcomes, short term as well as long term. There are numerous studies that support and collaborate the fact that good nutrition during cancer treatments can affect outcomes. Keeping this in mind, early nutrition intervention in head and neck cancer patients is very important. A dietitian can be a very valuable member as a part of the care team and an ally to the patient and the family. Have you ever wondered what happens inside a research laboratory or who the people are who are working on new treatments for head and neck cancer? Join me, Dr. Elaine Emerson, and members of my research team for a special virtual tour of our laboratory. Mucosamine mouthwash and oral spray can be used together to provide a convenient and effective way to help you with the effects of cancer therapy. The mouthwash and oral spray have been proven to reduce the symptoms of dry mouth, provide rapid pain relief and help treat and relieve the symptoms of oral mucositis. Hello, uh, Mike Heffernan here from uh, Dr Heff's Remarkable Mints. Uh, you may remember uh, Toby and I from uh, the conference last year. I can't believe a year has gone by. Uh, unfortunately, because of social distancing, Toby can't be in the same room. So I, I thought I'd bring uh, an, another alternative Toby along uh, to wish everybody uh, a great year. And hopefully next year we can all get back together again. Bye for now. I was a workaholic, super energetic, fit, healthy, and a really, really happy person. Didn't think for one second that, you know, cancer would hit me. Everything changed. Every waking moment, you appreciate everything much more. The hospital stay was really, for me, mentally challenging. I just wanted to have some inspiration, and in that environment, it's incredibly hard to find. I haven't spoke to a friend who was having treatment at the Rutherford. I decided to have a look 
It doesn't feel like you're coming for cancer. It feels like you're just coming to get well. It's a positive experience rather than I'm having chemotherapy. I'm really excited about my future. My advice for anybody starting their journey would be to surround yourself with positive people and to ask yourself, what do you want to do? And go and do it. Hooray. Head and neck cancer is a brutal treatment. When you take the ability to communicate off somebody and to eat and drink, you stop being a human being. So what we're doing is, courtesy of one of our sponsors from America, we're actually sending patients what we call a boogie board. The boogie board is a, is a piece of equipment that the patient can write on it and then push a button and that text disappears. So they we'll use this on our head and neck cancer ward for patients with communication difficulties, particularly after surgery, including laryngectomy. So the device allows you to write a message and then move on by deleting it automatically. And that's very useful for patients who can't speak, which is common after head and neck cancer surgery. Communication is very difficult after head and neck cancer surgery and it's frustrating for patients who can't communicate, but, uh, particularly if they've lost the use of their voice. So this kind of device is critical for communicating with family and caregivers and healthcare professionals during their inpatient stay. So the boogie board is a nicer way to communicate with your friends, your partner. It makes it so much easier for the patient to communicate. The Mouth Cancer Foundation and Swallows Head and Neck Cancer Charity have enjoyed a great relationship for many years. We are both passionate about supporting patients and carers every step of the way along their cancer journey. Working together makes us stronger, and when we are stronger, we can better serve everyone affected by the disease. Next we have Emily, who's an artist local to Edinburgh and is going to talk about the role of an artist in the medical setting. Emily Fong is an artist exploring life and death, embodiment and emotion and the experience of existing in a human container. Her presentation is called Journey of the Salivary Gland from the Patient to the Laboratory. Hello, my name is Emily Fong and I'm an artist speaking to you today from Scotland in the UK and I just want to say it's an absolute pleasure to be here and to be speaking to you at the first virtual International Head and Neck Cancer Conference. I know that we would usually be meeting in other circumstances but it's absolutely fantastic that we're gathered here to get today and I'm really grateful that you've joined me. So today I'm going to be speaking about a project that's really quite close to my heart. It's called G-Lands in Out-of-Body Experience, the journey the salivary gland takes from the patient to the laboratory. Now this isn't a project that I've been undertaking alone. It's an art science collaboration that's been based out of the Edinburgh University Centre for Regenerative Medicine. So specifically I've been working alongside Dr Elaine Emerson and her absolutely fantastic team and we've been working in collaboration with ASCIS Art and Science, directed by Miriam Walsh. So it's important also at this point to recognise that we've received funding support from the Medical Research Council, the Centre for Regenerative Medicine itself, and also the UK Regenerative Medicine Platform. So GLAN's an out-of-body experience. At the centre of that is really the salivary gland. That is the focus of this project itself. And I'm going to go into that in great, greater detail, but it's really the landscape around the gland that we're interested in and all the different parts that the gland might see along the way. So before we begin, I just wanted to begin with this slide here. So this is a drawing that I made at the first head and neck cancer support group that the Swallows organised at the beginning of the pandemic. So this happened online 
And I just, I wanted to say that it, it was such an inspiring thing to see this community gathering in this new way at a time where actually connection is much more important than perhaps ever before. And without the ability to meet in physical spaces, it was incredible to see so many people gathering online to support each other in this way. And for me, as an artist, I felt very, very humbled to be invited to that space and to witness this part of the process that's really quite important in, in history, really. This slide I also put here as a really important reminder for me to say thank you, and it's important that what I say before I begin this talk is that uh, I'm really grateful to the patients who have allowed me to witness and to observe parts or all of their treatment processes for head and neck cancer. And there's many vulnerable spaces that I've been allowed access into, and I think it's a really empowering and wonderful thing that so many patients have allowed me to do so and, and to share this, this content with you today. So it's because of them that we're here, and I just wanted to say thank you. So as artists and residents at the Centre for Regenerative Medicine, for the past 18 months or so, I've been working with this team and exploring the different ways that they are working towards a long-term treatment for um, the regeneration of the salivary glands. Now, the salivary glands are a really important part of our daily function as human beings. And for the treatment of head and neck cancer through surgery and radiotherapy, Salivary glands, unfortunately, are the ones that are really vitally damaged and potentially there are patients living with long-term side effects of dry mouth and that is because they have lost all or part function of these important organs. So when you think of saliva, it's not something that we actually think about every day, but really it's something that is in the everyday function of a human being, it is involved in communication so speaking, eating, digestion, um, very importantly maintaining the healthy environment of, of the mouth, so the teeth, um, and it really does affect so many more different ways that we, we actually function every day in our lives. So when these organs are damaged, it means that patients that are undertake, undertaking treatment um, unfortunately are living with these awful side effects. and. When I entered the Centre for Regenerative Medicine and Dr. Elaine Emerson told me about this, that the patients that she's working towards treating are living with this condition, I just thought, actually, that's, that's extraordinary and it's, it's awful to think that there might be so many people who are functioning without their saliva. So really that was the beginning of my... Um, my interest in engaging with what Elaine is doing at the Centre for Regenerative Medicine. And you might be wondering, what is an artist to do in these spaces? You know, why am I here? What's my purpose? Well, I think one of the great things that I, I do as an artist is actually I observe. So I'm, I'm a very keen observer. And not only do I observe, I actually translate my observations into drawings. And I think that drawing has a really powerful way and it's a really powerful medium to actually communicate the things that we we may see and we may not also have access to see so i've been given access to some incredible spaces and hopefully via drawing you're able to access those spaces with me as well so today i'm going to share a part of that journey with you not all of it but um, a good part so here I am observing in the Emerson lab at the Centre for Regenerative Medicine. And you see pictured here, Dr. Elaine Emerson here and her PhD student, John McKendrick. And the two of them are working on a tandem experiment looking at the saliva glands, but also the lymph nodes. So it's found that these two functions might be um, both vital parts in this process of treatment investigation. And as you can see here, what I'm really curious about communicating is that actually the, the white coats, which might seem fairly opaque um, to the outsider, are really there to protect the scientist or the clinician, um, but that actually what's going on behind that, um, that interface is actually quite accessible and it shouldn't be something that we're scared about. We can investigate it and be curious about these different spaces and the 
experimental processes. I've also been witnessing things like um, you can see here in the tissue culture core. So this is the Emerson lab members actually looking after their cells. So if you can imagine cells are components of the body, so they also, like us, need to be kept well. Um, we need to make sure that their environment is happy and that they're fed. Um, and this is what's happening here. It's a change of media. But really, the story of the GLANs begins right here. So on my first day in the Emerson lab, I was presented with this small pot, and inside this pot is actually a sample of human salivary gland, which at the time I just thought was completely extraordinary. I was being shown a part of the human body, and as someone who, as an artist, does not usually engage with this kind of material, um, I found it was really important to ask John McKendrick, who showed me this sample, whether or not the patient was actually alive. Um, because I think asking questions like that are really important for the way that I, as an observer and as an artist, engage with this project and this material. Um, and he said to me, yes, the patient is alive. The person who owns this saliva gland is actually alive. It's just that this portion of the organ has been removed through surgery and is now part of the research process in the laboratory. So, wow, there's a patient out there in the world and they have no saliva gland, but it's here. And I just think, how extraordinary is that? That's the beginning of this investigation and these questions that are starting to arise in my mind now of, how can a person live without their organ? And if this organ is not in their body, then actually it's having an out-of-body experience, really, isn't it? It's, it's contributing to the world in a way that the person is also contributing, but in an entirely different space, perhaps in an entirely different part of Scotland. Who knows? So for me, I was quite curious to know whether, through the creative process, could we actually observe how this organ arrived in the laboratory itself and what did it see along the way? Um, how is the patient living without it? Are they okay? What's going on? Do they think of their organ anymore? Might the organ think of the patient? These questions are a little bit abstract but also I think really important as a way to perhaps look at this whole situation a little bit differently. So in order to do that, I thought it might be important to name the organ. So I've named the organ Osiris, and Osiris is the name of the Egyptian god of the afterlife. Um, also quite fittingly, the Egyptian god of inundation and rebirth. So although Dr. Elaine Emerson might not be aiming to reflood the Nile, for example. Um, her aim is still really to return the saliva to the mouth. So, in a sense, we are talking about inundation. We're talking about flooding, reflooding the area that is the oral cavity in order to improve the lives of the patients again one day. Fingers crossed. So, Osiris is going on a journey and I'm going to tell you a little bit about this journey. Not the whole journey, but a good portion. So here we are in the neck clump clinic. So if, for example, you have found something out of the ordinary happening in the region of the head and neck, perhaps a lump, um, the first place you would go would be to be the head and neck, um, neck lump clinic at the Lauriston building in Edinburgh. And I've been fortunate enough to reach out to some of Dr. Emerson's colleagues on the external side of the lab, so in the different areas of the NHS. So here what I'm doing is I'm shadowing Mr. Ian Nixon, is the ENT surgeon. And on this specific day, there were about 13 different patients that came in and out of the clinic to visit Mr. Nixon. And his process was to investigate the neck and the head via, firstly by a touch, um, to see where that lump might be located and how it moves. Um, and then the next process is really to use this camera to go inside the throat and to see what's happening in there. And if it's possible to see this potential lump via those means. So here when I'm thinking I'm in the clinic with the patient, with Mr. Nixon, 
and also thinking about Osiris. So Osiris is still in the body. Osiris is perhaps a little bit anxious. Um, and what happens next? Most of the time, the lump may not be a problem, but sometimes it is. And if it is on the same day, there may be a biopsy taken. And if that biopsy shows that the person might need further treatment, then they progress to the next part of the, the process. So here we are in the MDT clinic, and the MDT clinic is the multidisciplinary team clinic, um, which is exactly that. It's a team of healthcare professionals who are all involved in the care of the patient. So I think this, this image is really important to share with you as a community because even though you may have undergone some of these treatment processes yourselves, um, this is not a space that you will probably ever have access to, um, not in physical form anyway. So if you have had some scans of your body or your head and your neck, they will arrive here and your clinicians will be undertaking, I guess, a team overview and making a decision from their different perspectives on how to move forward with your treatment. So you can see here what they're looking at are scans of the head and the neck. And also you can see there's a camera up here, which is the, the pathologist dialing in from the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary. So really this whole room is a, a quite a um, extraordinary and dynamic space. And so you'll have your surgeon, your oncologist, your dentist, uh, the nurses involved in your, in your therapy and your treatment, um, you name it, your whole team there ready for you to make the decisions that they need to make. So in this space, you know, I thought once again we're thinking back about Osiris because he's focusing this project um, on the saliva gland itself and what is the experience of Osiris in this room particularly? Well, what I found quite extraordinary was to think of actually all the different saliva glands that are in this room. So many, so many of them. So even though your clinicians might be focused on, on you and your scans at the beginning of, at the front of this room, where my mind is at as a creative person is thinking about all these different salivary glands that are hovering within the body. And also just being aware that at any one time, any of these people could be a patient. That's something to, to keep in mind and to note is that even though we may be well, we may also be the ones that end up needing to be at the neck lump clinic or needing to be in this MDD, MDT clinic so it's just being really aware that actually the head and neck cancer patient experience is something that is really important to be aware of, not only if it's something that is affecting us directly, because it could be something that affects either one of us in our lives or someone that we know and someone that we love. So in that way, Osiris is helping me to focus on the outside and the external community of, of really anyone. So at this point, if your scans have reached the MDT clinic, it's more than likely that you will perhaps need to progress to the next stage of treatment, whether that be surgery or radiotherapy. Most of the time, the two combined. So if you need to progress further, here we are in this next space. And this next space is the operating theater. But first, before we head into thinking about this operation, what I really wanted to share with you is this process of um, the anesthetic station. So before you go into the operating theater, you're, you're actually connected via the anesthetist to this machine here, which is involved in all of the parts of the, the caring for your, your vital functions while you're, you're uh, on the operating table. So taking care of your breathing, taking care of your heart rate and everything else that makes sure that you are very, very stable and able to be continuing with the operation itself. So this is a really, really important part of the process. And as you can see here, the station that's so intricate is on wheels. So it really does move with you from that initial process through to the operating theater and stays with you that whole time. Here you can see that uh, the anesthetic station is actually connected to the foot at the, the end of the operating table itself. So this is the, the surgeon. So if we move down the end of the bed here, you can see that there's three surgeons working on the operation. So they're beginning to open the neck here. And I should say that actually 
what I'm observing at this point is a parotidectomy um, or the, the resection of a parotid gland. So the parotid salivary glands are the biggest glands that you have. They're really the ones that sit on the cheeks here. And I think it's really important to share with you here just how much of a collaborative environment this operating theatre is and actually how peaceful it is which may seem contrary to um, the feelings that you might have pre-surgery or even post-surgery, not knowing what the spaces look like, but actually within these spaces themselves, there is so much expertise in the room and so much calm. So much calm and so much communication between one another and everybody has their own role to play and they're playing it very, very well and very aware of, of everyone else in the room. And as you can see here, there's three surgeons and at any one time there was three or four always working on the one patient. Um, so that's really important to be aware of. And also what you can't see in this, in this drawing here is behind here is also the nurse. And so the nurse is there also for the entire duration of the operation and they're a really important part of the process because they're involved in making sure they're passing the right implements all the time, back and forward. Um, they're involved in weighing everything. So should there be things that are removed from the body itself and the implements themselves and making sure that everything is always in its right place. So back to Osiris. You might think that the operating theatre and the operation itself is the end of the story. You know, I've had my operation and that's done. But actually, it's, it's this salivary gland once again acting on behalf of the patient, in fact. Because if you can imagine this organ that's been removed, it's not only a problem, it's, it's almost like an archive now. It's full of information. So what it's doing is it's, it's now delivering this information to the next stage to be able to understand what's happening with this tumour, has it been entirely taken out, um, what structures has it affected, um, and here you can see this is the skin, this element of skin just on the top of the salivary gland itself, which is fairly life-size, and you can see that this little puncture at the top is actually where the tumour is beginning to protrude through the skin itself. Um, but once you flip it over, you can also see the landscape underneath, whether it be muscles or tendon or a layer, areas of parotid gland itself. So Osiris is on its way to be able to tell, tell the, uh, the pathologists at the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary what's happening next. And that's the end of the surgery, where the patient is being well taken care of. And the whole process has been very, very neatly closed into a wound that will eventually become a scar. Um, but what I wasn't aware of is actually that the healing process of this scar is actually is very, very quick. Um, and as you can see, very carefully done. And also a drain has been inserted so that the whole area is kept clear and able to be healing quite well. So here we are at the Edinburgh Royal Infirmary. So Osiris has been delivered in this little pot as we saw earlier. So once again, we're, we're following this structure. And this site here is really important and it looks a little bit, if I have to admit, it looks a little bit like a chopping board. Um, so it's a creative site um, for observing. And in fact, I found very similar, similar, a lot of similarities between the pathology lab and the artist studio, for example, you can see with the array of, of inks, which you would, might question what is their purpose, um, but actually they're really important elements for observing. So as you can see here, there's a little pot and the organs are taken out and placed onto the site. And here I've written anatomical landmarks because what they're doing is they're looking for different landmarks within the organs themselves and finding different ways to observe what's going on. So what they're doing here is harvesting lymph nodes. So your lymph nodes are also taken out at the same time as the parotid gland itself. And they're very important because they measure if 
how far the tumour has spread, if there is a lot of tumor, a lot of cancer within the lymph nodes in themselves, then that affects the different staging of the cancer. So the inks, what are they doing there? So they're used in order to cover the surface of the organ itself. Um, and that helps the pathologist to determine whether the edge of the organ is actually an edge that's been made by the surgeon through the, the operation or whether it's a cut that's been made in the pathology lab itself. So that's very, very important. Um, and then what happens after that is the small parts of the organs are put into these little plastic containers called cassettes. And the cassette is closed and then now it goes to the next part of pathology which is to put these cassettes into this area of processing and diagnostics. So they're placed into a bath of formaldehyde and then processed into little wax containers and then from there they can be sliced into very very thin slices and put onto slides for microscopes. Um, so you're once again being able to um, investigate Osiris in their small parts underneath the laboratory microscope. Really this pathology lab is quite extraordinary, it's a bit like a factory um, and it's extremely important and when the organ arrives it's given a number and at the beginning of that process that number is checked multiple times just to make sure that each time along the process the number is kept consistent so that it can then report back. So this is by no means the end of the story. There's so much more to see. And for me, I'm really excited to ne see the next part of the, the process of oncology and radiotherapy and to understand what the patient experience of that is like. Um, but that will most likely happen when the world gets back to normal, post-pandemic, whenever that is. But it's really important to remember that once we're looking at the, the salivary gland as the central element of this story, this Osiris, there's so many different perspectives to be seen in the landscape of the g -lands. And I'm really excited to have been able to share a small part of that with you today. And I just wanted to say that I hope you've really enjoyed this first day of this first virtual International Head and Neck Cancer Conference. And if you haven't been made aware yet already, um, Dr. Elaine Emerson here is pictured with me in the lab, is speaking tomorrow at day two of the conference. So if you haven't already done that, please do sign up and go and hear her speak directly about her fascinating research. Um, and the title of her talk, I believe, is Returning the Spit to the Mouth. So hopefully you're now aware of how important that is. And I'm sure if not firsthand, you're experiencing this already. Um, that it's something that I guess a level of awareness will help you to have a certain amount of compassion for, for those people you know that are experiencing dry mouth. It's been a real privilege to be part of this project and I really, really hope that this work enables patients and their families and clinicians and the public really to have an understanding that healthcare and experience of disease doesn't need to be necessarily terrifying to understand or hard to access. Um, it can actually be a really interesting way to observe and to live in your body in a different way. Um, and thank you very, very much for listening. If you're really interested in this project, you can go and find out more at my website at emilyfongstudio.com forward slash glands. And you can read more about the blog, on the blog, more about this project there. Also, I wanted to let you know as well that within the next few months or so, I'm really hoping to do some patient interviews via this digital platform, whether that be Zoom or something else. So if you're a patient who would really like to share your experience with me, please do get in touch and you can do that via my website and we can figure out a way to, um, to have a meeting from wherever you are in the world to, to my studio here. Otherwise, I hope that you're well. Please take care.
I saw a patient the other day. I said, sorry, but you get six months to live. He said, I don't think I could have paid my bill for another 12 months anyway. I looked at his chart, I said, I think you got 12 months to live. Hello, my name is Rebecca Spurn. I'm a dietitian with Northwell Health, Department of Radiation Medicine. I work with outpatient oncology patients. I think that it's really important and beneficial for a patient with head and neck cancer to work with a dietitian because in the situation that a cancer patient is in, there are many, many things that are out of your control. But how a person chooses to manage their nutrition and what they eat is something that they can control. And this is something that dietitians can be really helpful with. When I'm working with a cancer patient, my two main focuses are to try to help them manage their symptoms and to also try to help them get the calories and protein and fluids that they need to get through the treatment as strong as possible. And I think that every head and neck cancer patient who is affected so much by their treatment, because of the nature of the treatment, it really affects their ability to eat. And I think that we as dietitians can be so helpful in maximizing a person's ability to get the nutrition they need to be as strong as possible throughout their treatment. In addition, I think that dietitians can be really helpful in teaching healthy eating habits and not the least of which we can also be very supportive emotionally for all the challenges that patients are encountering. The University of Edinburgh's Centre for Regenerative Medicine would like to take you behind the scenes of our research. Join me, Dr. Elaine Emerson, for a special virtual tour of my laboratory and to find out more about our research into new treatments for patients recovering from radiotherapy. Mucosamine mouthwash is a soothing mouthwash designed to become part of your usual daily dental routine. It's not always practical to carry the mouthwash around with you, so Mucosamine Oral Spray comes in a convenient 30ml bottle with a long nozzle to help you get those hard to reach areas in your mouth for fast targeted relief when and where you need it. Hi, it's one of you come and say hi, I did it. Right. Now Mike's gone, I can take that off. Uh, it's Toby from Dr. Hess, just wanted to say hi and thanks to uh, Sharon and Chris for letting us come and say uh, hello on this virtual conference. Um, sorry we can't be there today, but i really looking forward to next year, so hopefully we can meet each other face to face again. Have a great conference and see you again soon. Cheers then. Hi everybody. My name is Mark Lawler and I'm from Queen's University in Belfast. I'm Scientific Director of DataCan, the UK's health data research hub for cancer. We see data as being a little bit like oil. And just like oil, it needs to flow. And then we can use that data to help us in earlier diagnosis of cancer and in providing better treatments for cancer patients. Despite having no symptoms whatsoever, somebody sits in front of you and says, I'm sorry to tell you, Mr. Colgrove, that you have prostate cancer. I have a routine blood test every year and then I had the MRI and that's when they found a P-shaped tumour in me. In fact, it was through you that I found out about proton therapy. The actual treatment with the protons takes less than two minutes aside and that's quicker than a slice of toast. Seeing the tech and the facilities is all fine and it's smart and it's plush, but that counts for nothing if the people aren't giving you a feeling of security and support. And that's what the Rutherford Centre did so well. Oh, flipping heck. <laughs> Hi, I'm Liam from Flynn Health. We know that most patients undergoing radiotherapy treatment will suffer some kind of skin reaction to this treatment. 
which is why Flamagel RT is clinically proven to reduce the effects of radiotherapy-induced skin reaction. Over 90% of patients say that it soothed the pain and the heat from their reaction with its cooling effect, and it reduces the intensity of that red, dry, itchy, irritated skin. And it's easy to apply, it's not sticky or greasy, and it dries on the skin very quickly, allowing you to get dressed and get on with the rest of your day. Thank you everybody. Now before we go, we have a special announcement. We are delighted to confirm our conference in 2021 will be hosted in the wonderful city of Cardiff. The capital of Wales. It is the United Kingdom's 11th largest city. You'll never be short of ideas and inspiration while visiting this wonderful city and the conference will again be full of international speakers and lots of laughter. Our conference president will be Mr. David Owens, a consultant ENT surgeon at the University Hospital of Wales. Hello from sunny Wales. I'm Dave Owens, a consultant head and neck surgeon working at the University Hospital of Wales. Together with the Non-Surgical Cancer Centre for Lindra Health Board, we treat just under 200 new head and neck cancer cases per year and serve a population of just over 500,000 people. As part of a larger South East Wales head and neck cancer network with our sister health boards, we treat around 750 new head and neck cancer cases per year in a population of around 1.5 million. Here at the University Hospital, we are preparing for a second wave of COVID-19. You can see construction of our new 400 bed surge hospital is rapidly progressing. With this development, we feel that we'll be able to meet the challenges of a pandemic spike without a major effect on our elective workload. I hope you're enjoying this year's virtual conference so far. I'm delighted that Cardiff will host a 2021 event. The conference will allow us to showcase the excellent care and innovation seen in the diagnosis, treatment and ongoing care given by the head and neck teams of Wales. It is an enormous honour for myself and the wider head and neck community in Wales to have Cardiff chosen as a venue for the 2021 conference. I can't promise the weather will be better than now, but pandemic willing, you will receive a warm, if not dry welcome and I look forward to seeing you all here. Thank you everybody and we can now go live to Boston USA and to Arthur Loretano and he's looking forward to hosting the question and answer session. It's over to you Arthur. Good afternoon I'm Arthur Loretano here I am from Boston. Uh, things seem to be better all of a sudden. Got a little glitch there. But in any event, we had some wonderful speakers for this afternoon session, just as we did this morning. And so we're going to run a panel discussion. Uh, we've got all the uh, speakers from this afternoon. So we're going to jump right in. And the way we did this earlier today was to uh, take some initial questions. Now, this afternoon session was really great about individual experiences. And I wrote a few notes and then we did get a few questions as well. Uh, so I just want to make sure everyone is on is... Uh, Let's see, is Dr. Lewis on? There's Dr. Lewis. All right, very good. So uh, you touched on actually two points, really, or I mean, one, multiple points, but two big things that I got. One was in the COVID-19 era, the whole idea of social isolation, and then, you know, moved into the fact of something we've seen as well, which is people not coming in for screening. And then you spoke, you know, very um, eloquently about all the mouth cancer awareness, mouth cancer screening, getting to your dentist, having those things checked out. So what I wanted to do is ask you, you know, a little more specifically ways that you see people sort of getting around the COVID-19 isolation or again, the detrimental effects you've seen from that. Yeah, well, um, as uh, England goes into our next lockdown this week, um, then of course things are gonna get tough again for everyone. But all medical centres, all dental practices will remain open. 
and we'll be doing a, a full range of treatments, including those vital examinations, which is when we get the main opportunity um, to look for early signs of mouth cancer. And uh, another um, initiative that we're trying to uh, take is to encourage all dental specialists to look at their appointments as well, because people... I think Dr. Lewis has frozen. That's his end, I think, yeah. Okay, good, yeah, because I'm still alive. All right, well, we will come back to him. Um, just a quick comment from myself. We, in our area, dentists shut down for about three to four months completely, just did not take appointments at all. Um, I'm curious from others if you had similar experiences um, in your areas. So, Ian, let's go to you. I see you nodding. Yeah, we had the same experience that certainly temporarily, not the hospital dentist service, but um, the community dentist did close and they provide a screening pros. Uh, they sc provide a screening program for head and neck cancer in Scotland, but also um, obviously, you know, kind of um, uh, ongoing follow up for patients and from dental hygiene point of view, because it's not all provided by the hospital sector. It's getting back going. But I, I, I personally, I'm not quite sure how Scotland are in a slightly different phase of lockdown from England, but um, I'm not sure how that's going to impact because they are back up and running again, is my understanding. Uh, here in the States, I can tell you it was interesting when they ramped up, obviously they used the um, personal protective equipment and Ian and I can definitely relate to this because we're ENTs, we're both in people's mouths. Um, in, in, and I mentioned on the earlier panel today that in the United States, most dental care is not covered. Um, so people pay cash for it, which means a lot of people don't get dental care. And on top of it now, our dentists are actually uh, charging a surcharge for um, personal protective equipment Maybe. that they use. Yeah. So they're actually charging the patients an extra $25 to $50 for the um, allotment of PPE that you're using, which obviously we don't do in our medical practices. So it is interesting. Um, Arthur, Arthur, yes, sir. I'm going to tell you a true story. Here in Blackpool, um, we had a gentleman that in the last lockdown had a, an ulcer on his mouth, um, couldn't get to see the dentist because they were closed. By the time he finally found someone to see him out of the area, unfortunately, the cancer was that far gone. And we lost him three weeks ago to the battle. Yeah, All bro. because COVID stopped him going to get early diagnosis. Now, I'm not saying that it would have been a different outcome, but who knows? But that's the reality of not having dentists operating and looking at people's mouths. So, you know, it's, I think it's a massive thing and, it, and, you know, dentists have a big part to play. And I know that Philip and the Mouth Cancer Foundation are always doing their best on that. But that's reality. That's the real story. Yeah. But that's, that shouldn't happen again this time um, because all of the practices will be remaining open during this lockdown. And um, as I was just saying before I lost the uh, Zoom link, um, we're also asking all uh, dental specialists, that means endodontists, orthodontists, all these other people that people see, to do an early detection exam as part of their follow-up appointments as well. Because it's um, estimated that in the, this country, 16 million people have missed appointments since the beginning of the March uh, lockdown. And that's effectively 16 million opportunities to do an early detection exam and we are doing absolutely everything we can to catch up on that and to give people as much access as they possibly can excellent thanks and that is that is just huge um you know and, and i've had a similar story chris where a gentleman in fact i brought this up at a uh, statewide uh, board i was on a patient who kept telling his doctor he had jaw pain and they kept trying, or sinus pain, I'm sorry, sinus pain, and they kept trying different medications all through televisits. And ultimately this gentleman had a maxillary cancer and I, you know, fortunately we were able to get around it. I took off his maxilla for that. But one of my points at the state level is if a patient's had three or four televisits with you complaining about the same symptom and it hasn't gone away, it's probably time to bring that patient in the office and see them or, you know, at least refer them. And, and that was definitely a recommendation people took. Um, I'd like yes, to move also, um, something oh, go ahead, Bill. No, that's something we, we've done here as well. During lockdown, a lot of us were using tele-dentistry to um, try and uh, consult with patients. 
But it isn't an alternative to coming in for a face-to-face visit. It's really difficult to take photos inside your own mouth, as anyone who's tried it will know. And in the office, we use professional photography equipment, and it's still difficult. And there is really no alternative to actually examining a patient um, in the flesh. Yeah, and I don't know if Ian has tried this, but I tried to do a fiber optic exam telemedicine on a patient. I just kept hitting the computer screen. It just wouldn't come out the other side. It was really frustrating. I hate when that happens. Anyway. Well, but it, uh, it may be worth mentioning that we could, um, that obviously you can't examine people face to face without seeing them face to face. And uh, endoscopy is impossible and intraoral examination is difficult. There's a group in the UK called ENT UK who've been during this trialing something called a symptom-based risk calculator. And if you put a symptom risk calculator into Google, uh, there is a website that will allow you to predict the risk of throat cancer based on, or head and neck cancer, based on symptoms alone. It's really designed for primary care physicians to more appropriately um, refer patients into into secondary care settings is the, is the way it's been done. But that's the way we're asking primary care physicians uh, in, in Southeast Scotland and how ENT UK are asking secondary care physicians to triage patients in a very resource tight environment using the risk calculator, which was designed in a population, I think from Liverpool, no, Birmingham, Newcastle, I think, and then validated in a Scottish population and has now gone live. So there are options. But, uh, you know, as John says, there's nothing quite like examining somebody, you know. Yeah. yeah and that's interesting. We've actually used a similar calculator uh, among the primary care doctors for, just for COVID, you know, people checking off symptoms uh, as to whether they can come in for a face to face or whether they should try to do it through telemedicine. And maybe we can talk a bit about telemedicine later. Um, it's actually something I've been doing for about three years in terms of follow up visits, you know, to save patients a trip in the office, save them a copay, quite frankly, which I know takes money out of my pocket, but I don't care. I want to take care of the patients. I do a lot of, uh, not, you know, pre-op consultations with patients the night or two before surgery, just to make sure they don't have any other questions. And there's no reason for them to come into the office for that. Now we've leveraged that during COVID. Um, I wanted to talk about some of the, you know, uh, Roz and John gave some great, just great perspective about lifestyle changes. And I know Chris and I have talked about this at length. Um, So, uh, you know, and I will tell you multiple comments about how inspirational uh, John and and Roz were. Uh, Roz, one question that came up for you, and and I can ask John as well, um, was about physiotherapy. Did you go through a lot of physiotherapy, uh, not just for the head and neck, but uh, for the fibula graft that you had for the leg graft? Well, I went... After my vasodilectomy, I was in the Hannesburg area for quite a while, and I went to a specialist, um, swallowing physio, and she helps a lot. So whenever I went back for a six-monthly visit, I would go and see her. And then she left for New Zealand. So when I was at home in Grahamstown, I went to see a local physio and I organized with her to phone the physio and she did some guidance as to what she could do in the mouth. Um, I did that for maybe a year and a half every now and again, but since then not. I have asked my surgeons should I carry on with physio? Now, okay, the one has retired now. And he said, uh, you could, but it's probably a waste of time. Now, I mean, I'm very rigid on this side of my face. This is where it all started. And I know that I do appreciate it when a physio does work, but the expenses add up. So how much do you do? And of course, I can sit there at home uh, while I'm watching TV doing it, but um, I'm afraid I don't have the self-discipline to do that. But I am interested in, particularly being a long-term survivor, I am interested in the long-term effects and hearing people talk about fibrosis and about 
shoulder pain, um, and should healthcare practitioners be encouraging us to maintain a presence with our physios? Great, thanks. John, in terms of um, your care and your, your during treatment and post-treatment care, did you use physical therapists at all? Am I on sound? Hello, am I on sound? Yes, you are. Oh, yeah. good. Um, right, well, you need to bear with me, people, because mine is 11 years ago and dementia has kicked in. However, I am very, very lucky because my wife teaches trigger point Pilates. Uh, right, so I can get any sort of stretching and physio, if you like, treatment at home, free of charge. Great, thanks. And um, I do find that a lot of the stretching exercises, because mine obviously is all to do with um, dry mouth and saliva, but nevertheless, I still feel very strongly that if you feel good and you exercise, then it really does help build the symptoms. It really does. Great, thanks. Can uh, I say something? Yes, absolutely. Um, about the fibula, and you know, I had um, slightly limited ankle movements as a result of that fibula removal. Um, last year, I started. As I'm typically, I'm getting older, I've had arthritis forever, I have all kinds of things crumbling. I went to a biochemist and I'm doing twice weekly sessions with her. And I know, for instance, that that has greatly improved the mobility of my ankle. And like John, I feel very strongly about the fact that that health professionals should be actively encouraging us to maintain an exercise regimen. I have yep. walked every day for years and years and years and years, but it's those focus uh, manipulations and that, that focus exercise stretching and lengthening that I think benefits us. Yeah, I agree. Great, thanks. Ian, do you... um? Refer, I know I refer a lot of patients for physical therapy when they have weak shoulders after a neck dissection to try to reduce the pain, uh, you know, the pull on the nerves. Do you use it for that or for anything else? Yeah, sure. We do that for routinely following neck dissection that quite a few patients will undergo during head and neck treatment. Um, and uh, But I, I think sometimes we're, we're saying physiotherapy and in the UK we would probably say speech therapy for management of trismus. Um, I think that we overlapped a little bit with this with the lymphedema chat earlier in the previous QA. Uh, that primarily the, the the what you might call physiotherapy for the the jaw muscles is performed by speech and language therapists in the in the UK. Yes. So we do use them and we monitor people people what they call inter incisor distance and recommend that patients who've been treated with radiation and chemo radiation in particular uh, try to maintain. Uh, their, their their jaw opening rather than losing it and trying to regain it because it's so difficult. That's very difficult after major surgery and fibular uh, reconstruction, as Ros has described. But um, yeah, I think that's that's critical because if you lose the mouth opening, it has a very bad impact on quality mm. of life. Yeah, good point. We've had a uh, you know issues with that, and our um, again this morning on the conference, our, our speech therapist was mentioned, Katie. And she does both lymphedema. She's also doing a lot with trismus and uses this device called the Therabyte that the patients use. And sometimes people just use tongue depressors where they put it in their mouth to keep stretching it open. Uh, I've had to do a few surgeries to release trismus. And trismus is when you just can't open your mouth or when your mouth is really tight. Um, and even in those situations, if you don't do post-op physiotherapy, it just shuts down. Uh, we have David Owens on today. And uh, hi, David. Um, David is our host for next year in Wales. He's a consultant otolaryngologist. So David, if I, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Your thoughts about physiotherapy since we're on the topic. Um, uh, I'm coming in. I, I think physiotherapy is absolutely essential. Um, and I agree with Ian in the much that we deal with physiotherapy for the limbs, the effects of neck dissections and laryngectomies and other surgeries to keep the shoulder function and the neck function but also the physiotherapy of the throat and the swallow are important too. 
And, um, you know, we use terabytes, um, but we use active early intervention whenever possible. As people have said before, you know, prevention is better than cure. And in trismus, that there's never a truer word said, get them treated early. And the exercises you can get online are available and we use regularly. Um, our patients are, have a physiotherapy review in, in hospital and are given exercises to go home, irrespective of whether they have weakness or not at this stage. But I, as everyone else has said, I think it's absolutely vital. Great, thanks. Uh, do you want more to add there? But That's great, thank you. Um, I have some questions for Roz and John, but I just had a thought for Emily. So Emily, I'm putting you on the spot next. So um, my daughters and I, my daughter and my son are both animators and uh, do a lot of illustrating as well. And uh, my daughter, in fact, took a bunch of my operating room pictures and painted them. And so I have portraits on my wall of a parotidectomy, as you had shown, uh, some thyroidectomies, and also a patient who I did a tongue resection on and pictures of that. So um, my thought is that the work you're doing is, I think, very important for patients. In fact, speaking to uh, things online, my daughter created a... Um, swallowing video just for our clinic on some animations. And then we, we sort of did the, uh, you know, sort of ex explain the um, exercises that people should do for swallowing. So my question is, have you found that outreach to patients, or have you done this, you know, where you involve them either in looking at your pictures or even possibly using art as therapy for them, which is, you know, what we do sometimes in, in our cancer centers, we have an art therapy thing. Have you done any of that or, or you know, had any experience with that? I have begun the process very briefly just before COVID um, came through, um, where I had a couple of meetings with some patients to show them these drawings um, that I've presented today. And it was a really powerful experience, actually. Um, and I think because these processes that people have undergone, um, if you can look at from a, a critical distance, I guess, that, that long perspective, um, yeah, it was a very, very moving experience for them to be able to see the spaces that they hadn't um, or couldn't see really, but were really relevant to their own treatment processes. Great, thanks. So uh, John and Roz, let me, let me post that to you first and then I'm gonna move on to some other questions. What would be your thoughts about that type of an interaction, you know, just especially at the beginning of the process or, you know, moving along in terms of that therapeutic type of approach? Uh, John, I'll ask you first. Yeah, well, I mean, I always think a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, and if you can actually show people, right, in, in a format that they can understand without, pardon folks, using great long words that they might be confused with, then they can see, yeah? And if you can see what's going on, then you can understand it better and maybe deal with it better. Was. Um, I read a paper recently on actually Mary Wells, who is speaking tomorrow. Um, I've interacted with her and um, I Google papers with her on. And there is one that patients were asked to visualize their cancer and to draw what their thoughts, um, how it looks. And um, I, my, my, my research and health communication is picture-ram based, aimed at kind of low literacy patients. So I'm quite interested in, in images and visuals. And I was very interested to see that um, they were able to draw um, some kind of association between how they depicted their cancer and outcomes. No, that was actually a paper about heart, cardiac disease. So I think asking the patients to visualize this is a great idea. And the few times during the process, I had a rough little sketch done for me by my first oncologist. I found it incredibly helpful. So yeah, start going. That's I think great. I think, Arthur, the other thing we should be doing as well is looking at the power of music to mm. be therapeutic. You'll see my friend on the wall. See my I friend on the wall behind me? Saw Bob Marley. Bob Marley. Our, our survivor stroke cancer song was Three Little Birds. Oh. Yeah? Every time every little thing is going to be all right comes on, 
then the whole room, if we had a meeting, the whole room started singing with it. And it just kept us going all over the world. And it got loads of people involved as well. So there's lots of inspirational music that you can use to help people just to relax and maybe even to start relaxing them enough to start communicating, to start talking about their true feelings. Because it's difficult sometimes to hide your feelings if you're crying your eyes out. Good point. Uh, two technical questions here. One um, is uh, Ben says he has been trying since April to get a dentist and now asked his ENT consultant help. Philip, can you help Ben? Chris asked me to ask you that. Can, can I just do a dental thing as well? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, current situation uh, personally here is uh, my wife was registered with a dentist here in Blackpool. The dentist that she was registered with used um, people on like a one-year uh, secondment, and they were the ones who did the NHS service, which you don't have to pay for. You get on prescription. Those people, because of COVID, are no longer in the practice. So my wife can no longer be in the practice because all they do now is um, private. We have okay. tried unsuccessfully to find a dentist in this area who will now take on NHS new patients. Can't find any. So that's bad news. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I wasn't dodging the question there. Um, but my Zoom feed keeps going down. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Um, yeah. Um, yes. Any patient who has a dental emergency can call 111 and the local arrangements will find an NHS practice in the area to see them. Now, it's easy yeah. to say in, in, in practice, uh, as I think most of us know, it's more difficult. Um, but that's your first port of call if you don't have a dentist. Now, if you do have a dentist, uh, then, of course, life gets a lot easier. Um, another thing you can do, of course, is just call around practices. And particularly if you are worried that you may have early symptoms of mouth cancer, um, I don't think it's going to be too difficult to, to find an emergency uh, appointment. Um, and certainly anyone who's uh, got a dentist, keep those regular um, checkup appointments if you can. Um, and just um, on the same subject, but a little bit differently, self-examine at least once a month. Have a look yourself, see if there's anything that looks to you to be suspicious. And if there is, get straight in touch with your dentist or your doctor. Great, thanks. Hey, can I come back on that? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, I think it's great that people self-examine, and I think it's, it's a must. I think the problem we've got with COVID is if you find something, there's that fear factor of going to see somebody. And who do I go? Do I speak to my dentist? And if I'm speaking to my dentist, they're going to charge me because, and I'm being furloughed, I've no money. If I ring the doctor up, he'll say, well, come back to me in a month's time and if it's still the same. And the problem is, like the gentleman here, in Blackpool, that's exactly what happened to him. He self-examined, went through the process, went through, you know, 111, in the end rang 999, and he had finally found someone, and then four weeks later he's died. So in reality, unfortunately, the system lets us down when someone does it. And, you know, dentists, whether they're on the NHS or private, I've got to take that call for it. And I think you've got to get that message out to dentists. If people ring up and ask for advice, it shouldn't be the receptionist saying, oh, you're not ready to go away. Yeah, um, can I first of all um, pick up on your first point, um, because I did try and illustrate in my talk, dental practices are very, very safe places to visit at the moment. And so are medical centers, doctors' uh, practices. So please, nobody should be put off from visiting 
um, because of the risk of being exposed to, to the virus. And again, as I said in my um, talk, of course, nothing's entirely without risk. If you've got to catch a bus to get to the practice, there's going to be an element of risk. But secondly, on the second part of that, the first port of call is a dentist. If you um, uh, contact a doctor with a problem in your mouth, chances are you'll be told to contact a dentist. And again, as I said just a few moments ago, most practices, if they think it's suspected mouth cancer, will see patients, and many, many practices would not raise a charge uh, for that sort of emergency consultation. Um, so maybe then, Philip, maybe then, Philip, outside this conference, me, you, and the Mouth Cancer Foundation need to get a message out to all the database of dentists that you have to say, train your receptionist to ask the right questions and give the right advice. Yeah, that I start. And that's something um, I'm um, privileged to be able to give lectures sometimes on uh, early detection of mouth cancer to dental teams. And I stress at those lectures the importance of the entire dental team. And again, I think I touched on that in my talk. The receptionist is such an important person, but has to be fully up to speed like everybody else uh, in the practice. Great, thanks. Uh, second technical question. Uh, Roz, everybody wants one of your t-shirts. Uh, <laughs> I, I will tell my friends who gave it to me. Actually, she asked to see my video, so uh, she should know that I show it live. <laughs> so one thing I wanted to talk about was, um, you know, we've, we've all been experiencing the COVID isolation and, and you know, people ask, uh, talk about this like it's the worst thing that's ever happened in their lives in terms of having to stay home, which, you know, it's not convenient, but nevertheless, it's life-saving. But people with head and neck cancer, you guys have alluded to, it go through a lot of isolation, a lot of changes. I, I also have always looked at this as a lifestyle cancer in terms of the way my patients approach it, because there's a lot of guilt. And I always try to get rid of that and say, look, you know, we've got the cancer, we're dealing with it, let's move forward. Let's not go back over, I wish I had stopped smoking ages ago for you know people who smoke or drinking or whatever. Um, there's the whole, at least in the United States, the whole negative connotation on HPV. You know, if you have an HPV related cancer, people immediately, you know, don't think you had some deviant behavior or something like that. And then there are the occasional patients who don't smoke, you know, didn't have an HPV positive cancer, yet people look at them negatively. And, and I think there's negative connotations on this. So I'm curious your thoughts on, you've already touched on it, but the isolation you felt both with having head and neck cancer uh, and then going through all the treatments you have. And, and then, you know, from there, how you've dealt with it to try to maintain the positive outlook that you guys have obviously shown, you know, in terms of making adjustments to where you go to eat, things you do, et cetera. So Roz, I have you on my screen right now. So I'll put you up first. Yeah, well, you know, it's a, uh, for me, it's been a long, slow journey. Um, and having treatments, recovering, trying to recover a normal life, carrying on lecturing, that's down again, get up, down again. Um, it's that one slide I showed, you know, who am I? What, what makes me get out of bed? And I think it's so important to identify where in this amazing world of ours we can make that much of a difference in someone's life. For me, that's always been training health professionals, training pharmacists. Uh, but after my manager directed me, I could not do that anymore. Um, energy wise, I can't expect English second language speakers to hear me all the time. Um, but I have been able to retain postgraduate students, and I do now one on one. So that has enabled me to stay connected with research. Um, and for me, my little bit of patient advocacy that I can do 
when I present at conferences. Here's Stephen Bernstein. I know no one who has had neck cancer. In PE, I keep on asking them, is there anyone I can speak to? I'm never with other patients like me, so I can't really help them. Maybe now that we've all got more used to doing things online, I might be able to play a bit of a role. Um, I also, with, with reference to COVID, I mean, what was the difference? Um, I'm delighted that I'm, I, I'm not feeling envious about missing out on restaurant experiences. I can't do that. I can, but it's really hard. And I, I, I was in Cape Town visiting with my husband, visiting our boys. And I ended up in a noisy restaurant, and it was crowded, by the way. Thank heavens I didn't get COVID. And I sat there like a mute for those few hours. And it's a very disempowering situation that you're in. And I think you have to learn to juggle isolating yourself totally, and then you have no interaction. And I think interaction is energy. We get energy in when we are with friends. You have to juggle that with, okay, I can try and do that occasionally with friends who know me well. And I think, John, you spoke about that, with yeah. friends. Um, we all find our own way. And for me, it was having some meaning. And for me, I've also gone on a long self journey. Who am I? What am I like? What, what kind of uh, undesirable characteristics do I have? So I've worked on myself as well as my outward life. Great. Thanks. John, your thoughts? I think, yeah, um, my first, if you like, contact with... Uh, head and neck cancer isolation came uh, during the meetings, the Swallows Carers and uh, Patient Support Meetings, when people came along and some of them had not been out since the treatment. They'd, they'd mm -hmm. isolated themselves at home. And the first step to come to the meeting was the first step in them getting back, if you like, into life. And I always remember, and I quote that a lot of the ladies and gentlemen that came the patients and the carers at the end of the meeting came up and said that was great we just needed someone to listen yeah. and once they realized other people were in the same situation as they were then it was lovely at the next meeting which was a month later for them to report that yeah we've been out twice we've been out eating twice because they'd made the first step um, the way that we're coping yes. with COVID isolation is quite simply by, I mentioned Guinness and Real Ale. It's not alcohol anymore. It's isolation medication. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Chris, your thoughts on that? I know we've gone out for dinner before. I know there's things, you know, you do eat, you don't eat. And, uh, you know, I know you've yeah. said it. I think isolation is is horrendous um, for anyone, never mind cancer patients. And I think now the general people out there without cancer getting isolated, they get a little bit of a flavour of what head and neck patients go through. And I think all cancers are bad, don't get me wrong, but I think head and neck, when it affects your voice and your ability to eat and swallow, then you stop becoming a human being. And once you stop becoming a human being, then depression comes in and then suicidal thoughts come in and all the other bad stuff comes in, which makes you very, very isolated. It took me a long time to get out and start eating again. I still struggle on certain things, but now I don't get hung up on what I can't eat. I celebrate what I can eat. And I'll always try new things because what I've learned is something that I can't eat today Tomorrow I'll try it and I'll be able to eat it. But then I'll try it the day after and I won't be able to eat it. It's just, I think, I've suddenly realized the power of our brain. Our brain can take over your thoughts and how your body reacts. I really do think that. And I think if John and a few of the other speakers, I mean, look at Ross, you know, if you ever want to be inspired and, and want to be positive, then 
you know, my, my story and my journey was a piece of cake. But what I like about mm. what we do as patients when we come together and carers, we always think we've got the worst journey. But you always find mm. someone that is worse off than you that's had a worse journey. That's what inspires you to get going. Eating and drinking, communication is what humans do. And unfortunately, you medical people, which you're all wonderful people are doing, you know, your goal is to cure cancer. And thank God that you're getting very, very good at that. Quality of life is important. Survivorship <laughs> is not survivorship without quality of life. And eating, drinking, communicating is the bedrock of quality of life. So, think- yeah. So I don't know, but that's that's my thought, John. Yeah, I think I think Ros touched on it. Um, head and neck cancer is not just for Christmas; it's for life. <laughs> yeah, very true. One of the things um, we talked about this morning was exactly what Chris just said. That you know, f- from a clinician standpoint, for all of us, it's almost table stakes that we you know we want to cure cancer. We expect to do that, and that's what people come to us for. Um, you know, we do our best anyway, but it's really moved now to survivorship and quality of life to cure somebody's cancer, but leave them with a horrendous quality of life. Frankly, this is a discussion, you know, we have up front, even before we do someone's surgery to let them know potentially what things are going to be like. So uh, Ian and then David, um, you know, I can tell you in my own clinic, we have a social worker that we use, we really don't have great, well, in the United States, we have terrible mental health services anyway. Uh, and getting people into therapists and, and things like that is, is really hard. Do you have any um, psychosocial supports in your systems, uh, Ian and David? Yeah, well, if I answer first, in, um, in Edinburgh, we uh, most patients need some form of psychological assessment. We use a, we use a distress thermometer, um, and it's delivered by the clinical nurse specialists, and that allows us to highlight patients who have uh, it's you know severe problems who are then referred on to psychology support, but there's a massive lack of psychological support in the NHS in general. And again, these people tend to need it. We talked we talked something this earlier again that they, they need it quickly because there's no point saying you've got 18 months wait time. Uh, and so that is a real challenge for us providing that. But we try to do it for everybody through the clinical nurse specialists and then try to identify those who need the, the uh, are at highest risk. Very rare we use psychiatry, but we tend to use psychological support when required. I don't know if that's similar in Cardiff. David, oh, what are your very, very much so. The nurse, um, the nurse specialists are key to the um, assessment using a number of different questionnaires, but also with general discussion and uh, communication with the patients that you know, unfortunately, clinicians at times don't have time to do. Um, we have good links with our psychology teams. And I think, you know, it was highlighted in some of the talks during the day that that is so important. But I think that, you know, we could always have better, stronger support. And it's something that we fight for. And I'm sure you will say the same thing that, you know, it, it's, it's one of the number one things that we want. It's just difficult to get. Okay. Emily, I'm going to put you on the spot again. So you have been really, you know, in your artwork, you've been an observer of a process. Um, and, and, you know, I'm going to make the assumption here that you've neither had head and neck cancer nor know anyone who does. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe I missed something there. But um, what is your thought watching? The, like you've done something that I always thought was cool, which is, you know, you, you've watched people go through this. You showed the pre-surgery anesthesia area. You showed the surgery. You showed the things afterwards. So as an observer, how do you see this process, both from the, how the clinician side works and then from the patients and, you know, what you might be able to say to the patients about the process, about seeing people like we have with Ross and uh, John here, you know, how positive um, they are. So I'm curious, your observations. You know, I think that's one of the, the most interesting parts of this project has been seeing all of the different perspectives and um having that, I guess, quite unique point of view, being able to see uh, where everybody is at. And I think there were some things mentioned in the earlier talks this morning about having, um, I'm not sure the term that was used, but it was something like a navigator or something. Um, And I guess 
yeah, in an unofficial way, it's this process has felt a little bit like being a kind of creative navigator, mm. wandering through um, the different perspectives. And um, I actually, I do know someone who, who had head and neck cancer. My granddad actually passed away from head and neck cancer when I was 14. Um, and I didn't see any of the process at that stage and at that age. And I think this has been a really, um, I guess, powerful healing process for me in a way too, to see um, from a personal point of view that actually the whole process is really well guided um, and well scaffolded, I guess, um, through every stage. That sounds great. I, I think, and I think that's important for patients to, um, you know, know as, as we say in the United States, sometimes it's important to see how the sausage is made, or I guess in this case, how the haggis is made. Does that sound right? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I don't want to know that. You know what? Uh, I, do you, know, do you know what I find amazing about? Uh, you guys think about, Emily's, that? about Emily's work. Emily's work. You know, she's taking something out of your body, something a picture out of your body, and taking it on a journey. And when you see the drawings, I mean, we saw it on presentations, but I have met Emily and saw her drawings, you know, and it, they're incredible because suddenly she's put this piece of organ from your body, give it a name, and now it's on a journey. And not only that, the person's living that that journey is from. And to be able to, you know, when I got my biopsy, as, as thick as I am, I thought it just went under a machine and a machine says you've got cancer or you don't got cancer. What I didn't realise, someone actually has to slice it up, do all these wonderful things, and then tells you guys what how you should treat us. And what Emily does is brings that alive. And I think, I mean, I love art, and I think art should be used an awful lot more. Um, you know, art is, is a special media that can break down a lot of barriers from young children through to you know, a 99 plus year old person. So Emily, well done. It was a great talk. And, you know, I want to see more art. So, but yeah, I just, you know, a lot of people on, on YouTube and have been sending me questions is saying that they didn't realize you could live without your organ in your body. And, you know, and there you are giving it a name. And I think that's amazing. So, you know, I, I'm blown away by Emily's projects and I look forward to seeing more of it. Yeah. Thanks uh, very much. Great. Um, one thing we didn't touch on in this session that we talked a lot about in the earlier one was carers. And, you know, we've talked about isolation and um, we haven't talked much about carers and, you know, or, or what we call caregivers, support, family, friends, etc. cetera. So uh, again, I want to speak to the people who are, you know, our survivors. Um, so, uh, Ross, you know, how did this affect the people around you or the carers or what could we as clinicians or others have done to support the carers more? And then John and um, Kurt, um, um, Chris. Kurt. Well, <clears throat> I have, uh, have a bit of a different experience in that um, for most of my operations, I had my sister present and then I stayed with her for those first two, three weeks before I flew home. Um, once home, now I'm married to a British man whose heart lives in Wales, by the way, David. Um, and uh, he's not all over me and uh, asking what he can do for me. He's a bit of a hands-off kind of person. I'm a very independent person. So in terms of care, he's there. I know he is always there for me and he'll do anything. But he's not the one who will say, Rose, you haven't eaten. Uh, whereas when I'm with my sister, she will notice that and do it. Um, I, in terms of parents, in the more severe parts of my journey, I also count my friends who have brought food around, who have looked after me really well. Um, so I've not experienced like a partner 
who has taken on the entire burden of caring for me. Um, I've, I've done all the medical aid stuff, all the appointments, all my own flights and ends, just because it's who I am and I'm used to doing that. Um, so I can't really talk about terror burden, although having said that, my husband is the one who sees the real me, uh, whereas no one else does. Um, and it's not because I want to hide it, it's just so it's not nice to go spewing and coughing and spitting and you know, in, in front of other people. And I'm reluctant to do it in front of my husband, even. But she can't get away from it. She signed up for it. Yeah. John, your thoughts on the carers? I'm here. Did I lose John? Oh, there you are. John, you're on I'm mute. My phone. <laughs> You're on now. Yes, you yeah, are. It's that, it's, that, it's that Chris Curtis keeps unmuting me. I've <laughs> seen a change in I've seen a change in the name carer to caregiver. Yep. Um, a carer, if you talk to somebody who isn't involved with all of this about a carer, they're an employee of a care home. And it's a different role completely. A carer in a care home is more medical, nurse. Um, whereas caregivers in our situation are people who give us care in all sorts of different ways. So I think we need to change the name. In terms of my experience, my wife, obviously, my family, everybody who was involved in, and uh, Derek mentioned it earlier, that he was like me, he was living in one area and was given treatment in a different town. So you've got communication issues there, which were still there 11 years ago. But I think um, carers need to have their own particular journey. And I know the Swallows did a lot of work last year, Chris can uh, expand on that, in terms of the carer journey as well, sorry, the caregiver's journey, as well as that of the patient. And that's important. Chris? Yeah. Um, I can't talk, and I wouldn't dare try to talk on behalf of a carer. A, anyone that knows Sharon, if I'd done that, I wouldn't be here tomorrow. Um, but, you know, I lived my journey as a patient. She lived her journey as a caregiver. We both went on the same journey, but as she says many a times, we were both on different tracks, yet we were on the same journey from A to C. And, you know, Sharon was my my godsend, and I don't think I'd be here talking to you today. Well, I know I wouldn't be without her. She, I don't know how we didn't get divorced. You know, I, you may have seen the little bit of a spoof film that we put up with Sharon talking. I'll tell you the history behind that. Sharon was doing a piece to camera about caregivers in our caregivers project. And as a joke, John, we do a lot of film work with John and he knows us all inside out. And he said to Sharon without telling her that the camera was rolling, now, tell, now you've said what you think people want to hear, tell the truth. What do you really feel? That spoof film that you saw came from the heart. When I saw that, A, I cringed and thought, my God, was I really that bad? But then I thought, Do you know what? That's a great message to send out there. That's how caregivers inside are feeling. So if you want to know about a caregiver's journey and what they feel, watch that spoof film tomorrow and listen and look in Sharon's eyes. That's the real journey of a caregiver. Yeah. And I don't think it's for any patient to ever try and talk on behalf of their caregiver. And if Derek was here, he would be mm -hmm. ripping me apart for even trying to talk to you now about being a caregiver. Derek had an horrendous journey as a caregiver, but he's an inspirational guy. They're the people that we all need to listen to, health professionals, dentists, health professionals, patients, 
companies, drug companies should all be listening to caregivers because at the end of the day, they're the ones that get us into survivorship and then have to live with us beyond survivorship. So I'm not going to talk on behalf of a caregiver. It's not my place to. But please watch Sharon's film tomorrow if you get a chance because that, look in her eyes, listen to the voice, that is spoken from the heart. And yeah, that's why I want to sound a caregiver. Sorry, Chris. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, can I just say, when you watch that film, alternative swear words are available. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, John, that's the, cl that's the, cl that's the clean version. <laughs> it, goes with, it goes with Ross's T-shirt. We need yeah. to sell the film and Ross's T-shirt together. We'd make a fortune. Yeah, you yeah. will. <laughs> Just a few closing thoughts as I know we're getting towards the end of our time. Uh, Philip, I hit you up early for a lot of things and I, I know I haven't asked you much towards the end. Any closing thoughts from your standpoint? Oh, you're on mute. There you go. Yeah. Um, we, we are in very challenging times at the moment. Yeah. Uh, the um, difficulty again for uh, dentists and the dental profession generally is uh, finding time to carry out these routine appointments. I was talking about how important it is to attend them. Um, but a lot of us are still really playing catch up at the moment and um, um, doing our best to get through the backlog of patients who have been disadvantaged by uh, what the events of this year. Nevertheless, I would just reiterate Anybody who even thinks they might have early symptoms of mouth cancer should telephone their dentist or a dentist and make that clear to them and they will get an appointment. Great, thanks. David, any closing thoughts? And then I'll go to Ian as our president of our conference for his final thoughts. So David. I oh, know I've enjoyed the day immensely. I've learned a great deal. Um, it's been a perfect insight. I look forward to seeing you all in Cardiff and watching tomorrow, of course. So thanks very much. David, one thing, one David. Thing, David um, since, uh, you know, we're virtual this year, so we haven't done any drinking, we haven't had fish and chips, we haven't had anything. <laughs> so we're going to double in Cardiff, so I hope you keep a budget, man. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll keep my wallet full. Uh, David, David, listen, I just hope that me and Ian in our opening film have not put you off because we've already written the script for next year. And now okay. we've seen your man cave. We've got some great ideas. <laughs> I, I bet, yeah, I'll start drinking now for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The only, the only thing is, though, Ian loved dressing up. So we, we won't go there. Absolutely. All right, Ian, close us out. <laughs> okay, well, it's been a great day one. Uh, covered a lot of ground, and I think everyone will feel they've learned a lot and heard a lot. Uh, and we're looking forward now to uh, day two, starts tomorrow at 10. Uh, a bit about research in the morning, and then more about psychology and uh, uh, supporting patients in the afternoon. But I guess we say thank you to the speakers today for the time they invested and uh, thanks to the panelists who turned up for the QAs. Uh, I'm getting the feeling from Chris that we've had a very good response to day one. I don't know how you feel it's gone, Chris, but hopefully we build on that and uh, all we have to do is outshine Cardiff. That, that's, the only, that's the only aim. Yeah? Well, you, you beat you've beaten Brighton last year, so... Hey, so you know, I, I'm just I'm just such a shame that we couldn't take everybody to Edinburgh because I know that you drink mm. a tea and a lot of coffee in Edinburgh. So, you know, it would, Arthur would have loved being in Edinburgh drinking tea mm. and coffee. Absolutely. Yeah. Both at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been yeah, a great day. Thanks to you as well, Arthur, for sharing these QA sessions so well. Yeah, Thank I you. have to say, you know, Arthur got up at 3 a.m., USA time, and he's been here all day, you know, and, and he deserves a round of applause. So well done, Arthur. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. So, my um, from my point of view, you know, it's been a great day. I was very, very worried. Um, I, it's the first conference in five years 
I've been managed to go and make my own cup of coffee. I've had lunch. I've not done any pressure work. Oh, it's been brilliant. And tonight, I'm not even going to end up in hospital. Last year, I ended up in hospital. So, hey, oh, it would be great. So, you know, enjoy the rest tonight. And honestly, I look forward to seeing everyone tomorrow. Ian, thank you very much, Arthur, and all the speakers. And John, you were funny as ever. Absolutely. And Ross, I love you to death. <laughs> Right. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.